Thank you.
Thank you.
Heritage Education Network believes culture symposium, community issues, and innovative practices. Make sure you join with our Facebook and YouTube. I want to you better today. All we know that you are the day. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of our viewers across the globe. Uh, welcome back to Culture on our second and final day of the symposium. My name is Dr. Rebecca Fergal Guan, and I am one of the directors here at HenV. Uh, I have the pleasure of being your host for part of the morning, but you will see my co-directors throughout the rest of the day as well. Uh, we want to express our sincere gratitude to the special guest moderators we had yesterday, Dr. Joanne de Forbam and Dr. Nicole D. Ramsey. It was our honor to have your words and perspectives be a part of our third annual symposium. Today, we will put a from our focus of uh, archaeology, history, and heritage that we had yesterday to focus a bit more on modern day issues. Although yesterday's topics are certainly just as relevant to modern day issues as those we will explore today. Uh, as an organization that's centered around heritage, we always take the opportunity to highlight the importance of understanding the past for making sense of our current world and to plan for the future. We hope that all of the presentations from yesterday have helped to highlight this and that they will continue to do so today. This morning, we will take a look at the many efforts that our fellow Belizeans are making to create thriving and resilient educational, literature, and arts communities within the country and beyond. We are honored to feature this work that is so fundamental to maintaining and growing the social and cultural resilience of Belize. Following this, we will then have a session focused on how we understand the legacies of indigenous Maya populations and how these bodies of knowledge can and are being used to diversify Belizean society, which aids in maintaining our resilience. We are excited to hear more about how ancestral Maya knowledge and the use of the environment, as well as language, both written and philosophical, is being explored and used today. To wrap up the morning sessions, we'll take a closer look at Belizean resilience by focusing on a few case studies, mostly from within Belize City. We'll see how literature has been used as a catalyst for change in social situations in Belize City's South Side, as well as how often overlooked group, young girls, cope and navigate from Belize. Following our lunch break, we have an exciting session exploring how processes of globalization and identity formation are shaping Belizean culture, and even explore the idea that we should redefine ethnicity within Belize. We are certain that these topics will generate exciting and fruitful discussion with our audience today and in the future. And finally, to wrap up our symposium, we have a very special session organized in collaboration with Ecomar that will feature the exciting work exposing the diverse histories of St. George's Key. This session will give us all a newfound appreciation and understanding of the reasons that we celebrate the holidays for September that we do here in Belize, including the Battle of St. George's Key Day, which is this coming Monday, of course. Uh, we truly believe that there is something for everyone today, so we hope you'll stay with us for the entirety of the sessions. But if you cannot, we also want to remind you that all of these streams, as well as the individual presentations, will be available on Heritage Education Network Belize's social media channels on both Facebook and YouTube. So follow us for more in the coming days, weeks, months, and hopefully years. Uh, we appreciate the community that you are helping us establish to maintain and grow a flourishing appreciation for Belize's culture and heritage. And with that, we'll transition into our first session for this morning, uh, perhaps a bit early, but maybe earlier than better. Earlier than late is better. Um, so uh, a, a good morning and welcome to any viewers just joining us this morning. It's my pleasure to now kick off the first of many sessions for our symposium. Uh, we are starting our second day of exploration of Belizean culture with a focus on sustainable education and arts. We are honored to have with us today Belize's foremost leaders in education, literature, and art, who will be talking about the thriving communities surrounding these topics they are making efforts to maintain and grow. What is clear from these diverse presentations is the vibrant culture Belize has surrounding education and arts 
and we cannot wait to see the fruits of these presenters' labors in the coming years. We hope that Belizeans can appreciate the work that these individuals are doing and we'll support them in their endeavors. Um, so our first presenters are Dr. Christopher DeShield, Dr. Joanne de Forbab, and Ms. Teresa Coye. Ms. Or Dr. Joanne de Forbab is the research director at the University of Belize. Ms. Teresa Coye is a senior lecturer also at the University of Belize. And Dr. Christopher DeShield is an assistant professor of English at UB in the Faculty of Education and Arts. He currently serves as the UB representative to the People's Constitution Commission. We are pleased to have Dr. DeShield and his colleagues present Higher Education and Belizean Social Justice in Curriculum Reform. So Christopher and Teresa, we're talking about our paper and we bring together social justice and curriculum reform. Christopher, you want to explain to the listeners and viewers why? So there, well, there's several reasons why we're interested in these topics of social justice and curriculum reform. Um, for me, what I found most remarkable about this current moment and this opportunity to uh, reflect on our current moment is the fact that we have twin processes occurring right now in Belize. There is um, curriculum reform happening, ongoing at the moment, that we're all involved in as teacher educators, and there's also constitutional reform happening. And while the two seem uh, appear on the surface at least to be separate, we have discovered that uh, these are in fact um, related, that there's considerable overlap between the two processes, um, and we were exploring that in our in our work. You know, there is a very clear suggestion that maybe they're not as related as, but they appear in the curriculum documents. We see the guiding principles that sort of align themselves to social justice. And when we talk about social justice, we're talking about things in terms of advocating to ensure that people who may be marginalized and not participating in education as they should, that they are included. And the question that we had in our discussions is, do these curriculum reforms really address those social justice mm -hmm. concerns? Yes. So primarily trying to rationalize uh, just Framework for Belize was actually kind of difficult because if you, there is no real definition according to Belizean standards. There is only the preamble of the constitution that alludes to some of the principles of social justice, but never actually specifies, oh, yes, this is what social justice means and right. in, in a very real uh, way. And what we found in the educational reform documents, the best plan, for example, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or the national curriculum framework, they allude on occasion that one reference to social justice. To social justice. Right. To social justice. And, and nothing else. And, yes. you, and you're like, what? Wow, yeah, and we know based yes. on our own reading and our own work in teacher education that Grant and Augusto tell us that, you know, social justice should be part of the reforms in education mm -hmm. to ensure that you remove all these, um, these inequities and injustices that are occurring as a result of this process of, in, of education. Mm -hmm. And so, Christopher, explain to us why we turn to... The, the constitution yes so when thinking about uh, social justice in the belizean context as you were saying there's well we've got some historical inequities that come out of our experience of being a former colony where education was not afforded to the vast majority of the populace exactly. a tiny minority had access to education um, back in the day and i think we're still suffering from some of those legacies um, at present and so the curriculum reform uh, is um, an attempt to address some of those inequities, as you said. The issue is, while social justice, as, as you were saying, um, isn't explicitly mentioned, there does seem to be a lot of references to concepts that are, of course, of re relevance to social justice. But the problem we've 
um, observed here is how do you make or how do you obtain a definition of social justice that fits for our Belizean context? And we turn to the constitution of Belize, the Belize constitution, to find this kind of uh, undergirding um, principle on which we could ground a definition and or an understanding of uh, social justice. And what did we find? So yes, we found that there is explicit mention of social justice in the preamble to the Constitution in Clause B. Um, but that explicit mention was, was actually quite powerful because it seemed to provide an imperative it's issuing an imperative for all Belizeans and all uh, domains of inquiry, of operation in Belize, in economics, in education, as we are um, involved in, to respect the principle of social justice. So there is a general imperative that is issued um, on the Constitution. So when you consider that imperative, um, it seems as if the Constitution then uh, behooves curriculum reformers to adopt a social justice framework in their reform efforts. That this ought to be a guiding principle um, governing these things. And so as researchers, we looked at the whole process of the curriculum review um, reform process, at the documents that are issued, um, and I examined them in the light of this, um, this imperative, as it were. And so what did we find? <laughs> we found that okay they've only mentioned social justice once really and in light of a religious framing for constitute oh, sorry curriculum reforms mm -hmm. but while they may have made some token um, references or contributions or discussions or suggestions of how they can rescue marginalized communities there's not much evidence of how they're going to do it or mm -hmm. where it's going to happen. And even when they share the information about how they come, they went through the mm -hmm. curriculum reform yes. process, Yes, they weren't talking to those marginalized communities mm -hmm. they say they're going to talk. They were talking to the business. That's their first order of, of entry. It is, they've repeated this notion several times. It's all about economics. What about art? What about history? What about all of those other things that Um, framework would require from teachers or yes. understanding. You know, and, and certainly as teacher educators, we know that social justice will should be, as Christopher just mm -hmm. said, the constitution tells us to focus on social justice in education. And therefore, as teacher educators, we have to fo focus um, social justice needs to be embedded in what we are doing our within our, uh, our practice, mm -hmm. but we are not seeing that as the curriculum reform. Um, the curriculum reform that is being pushed is the competency-based reform. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, is there an alignment between competency-based reform and social justice? Mm -hmm. Yeah, will it meet that, um, that imperative as the, um, as the Constitution demands? I think the, the National Curriculum Framework does make mention of the need to address uh, the underprivileged communities. And then the question is, how exactly will that be accomplished using the efforts that, um, that are currently um, being used there? And then the question is, to the person who is listening to this, or who mm -hmm. is thinking about that, or who has a child in school, or who has just signed up, what does this mean uh, about being you know, focus on social justice and teacher education. What does that mean? I mean, that's what we are investigating here in our presentation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What does uh, what does social justice mean um, in the Belizean context? So, for Belize, um, cons taking into consideration a decolonial, post-colonial, and all of the rhetoric that goes along those lines, if you take that into consideration, things like the inequities of gender or gender issues. Well, I mean, when we talk about that, we know in Belize that, um, for example, at the tertiary level, yeah, we have yeah. more women than men. Yeah. And so, 
And so is it that we have to think about how we get men into tertiary mm -hmm. education? Is that going to make it a social justice issue? Or the other issue where we know within the participation rates for secondary education, mm -hmm. for example, only 40% mm -hmm. participation. Belize has the lowest rates in the Caribbean mm -hmm. and this region and the Latin, Latin American, American region. Right. Yes. So how is the curriculum reform going to address those kinds of issues? Yes, they talk about increased access. But what will be done? And what do we do as teacher mm -hmm. educators to ensure, to ensure that, that what happens remains an advocacy for those yes. people who are marginalized, yeah. the isms and schisms of the... And so oh. that's our discussion, really, in the beginning of our discussion around social justice and social justice in teacher education. Mm -hmm. um, and so we raised some questions. How can we focus on social justice issues in education at all levels, not only in teacher education, but also um, primary and secondary yeah, levels. I think our, our role um, is, well, of course, being in this um, environment, in our role in, in the higher education sector, of course, we are kind of focused on what our responsibilities and are, are at that sector. But it didn't seem like there was a role explicitly articulated in the documents for teacher educators or persons in higher education generally. And so the, the, another aspect of the research is to articulate that role and discern yeah. that role. What are, what are our responsibilities as teacher educators in okay. contributing to this process, in um, reflecting on it, you know, analyzing it, and providing some feedback on these processes? What are our takeaways from this project that we engaged in? But one thing for sure we all came to realize is that as teacher educators, we must focus on social justice in education. We must focus on social justice in our preparation of teachers. And because this is, a, a, you know, it comes out of the Constitution, yeah, not so? Preambular imperative. Ah, I love the word. word. <laughs> yes. It's very sexy. <clears throat> yeah. So what, what, what's your takeaway, Christopher? Yeah, so I think this kind of defines our role. Uh, it outlines the responsibility we have as teacher educators. The Constitution itself seems to demand that um, we uphold these principles and we carry out this role in doing some classrooms because the teachers really have you know, influence um, and to encourage students to be able to analyze these real issues. And engage, and engage in practical, real, lived experiences kind of ways. I think it's very important also that we acknowledge the need for a, a reflexive kind of, reflective mm. kind of methodology in the way we engage with students, whether it's little ones, whether it's our big ones, it doesn't really matter. In order for us to really interrogate and meet the needs for those marginalized communities we've mentioned before, uh, we really need to build a capacity for a reflective um, understanding of your own socialization, no, your so own true. reality, reality mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that you come to the table with prejudices that are endemic or part of the society. You need to put yourself in check, check yourself mm -hmm. before you wreck yourself or before you wreck other people. Other people for sure, if we're yeah. talking yeah. about teachers. And you know, one of the concerns that I have is the curriculum reform and the curriculum documents we saw, how were they dealing with issues such as sexism, racism, how are those things being addressed? Um, how will students get the skills to think analytically around those kinds of concerns? Um, you know, and so social justice needs to be taught. We need to bring those words and embed and put them into our curriculum and think about social justice issues. So our work as teacher educators is, cut out, is okay. cut out. Um, I think that we are really happy that we took this journey to look at yeah. the curriculum reform, look at the constitutional reform and really 
remind ourselves of why as teacher educators we are doing what we are doing. It is, I think it's imperative that we remember that it is higher education's responsibility to interrogate these reform movements yes. mm -hmm. and to bring awareness to what is happening, how it will affect and to find a way through. Thank you, Dr. Deshia, Dr. Defoyev, and Ms. Koye for this salient discussion on how to better our education system through a focus on social justice on multiple levels. Uh, next on this morning's agenda, we have the presentation by Ms. Kayla Gentle. Ms. Gentle is a Belizean creative with a passion for the written word. It is because of that passion that she ultimately chose to pursue writing as a career. Kayla has self-published one collection of poems entitled Crossroads and is currently working on two Caribbean-inspired fantasy novels. She hopes to fill the sci-fi and fantasy genres with stories of those who, much like herself, never imagined seeing themselves in the pages of a book while growing up. She dreams of one day seeing Belizean writers taking up space in the literary and publishing world. Our second presentation is Ms. Gentle's Writing in Belize, Roadblocks and Roadmaps to Establishing a Thriving Literary Culture. Culture Symposium today. My name is Kyla Gentle and I am a Belizean writer. By day, I'm the editorial director of a travel magazine and by night, I am a fantasy author and poet. As I present to you today on writing in Belize, I would like to extend a heartfelt thank you to the ladies of the Heritage Education Network Belize for curating such a wonderful space for those passionate about culture and heritage to be able to speak on and share about these topics. I am grateful for the opportunity to share a bit on my passion, which is life as a writer in Belize. Now, before I delve into my presentation, I would like to begin with a prompt for you, the viewer, which is this. Imagine a world without writers. If you've been watching the news lately, you might be aware that has been a possible reality that Hollywood producers have had to contemplate. In the US, the mere scope of industries that are set to be affected by the ongoing writer strike, from late night talk shows to movie productions, is indicative of the very career options that those writers who hail from the global north have. In regions of the global south, like the Caribbean, however, pursuing a career in the literary arts is often seen as a futile and more importantly, a financially fruitless effort. Through this presentation, my goal is to highlight the inherent value of the literary arts, as well as the many underlying challenges that those in the industry must contend with since it is only by addressing those challenges that Belize's literary industry will be able to truly flourish. My hope is to be able to reassure aspiring Belizean writers that there is value in their craft and that a Belizean literary renaissance is very much in the realm of possibility. Now, I begin by looking briefly at the importance of the literary arts. Why do the literary arts matter? There are several reasons, but I would like to focus specifically on three. Firstly, the literary arts play a crucial role in cultural preservation. In her 2021 Culture Symposium presentation, The Writer as a Cultural Activist, Belizean author Ivory Kelly notes that writers are, whether consciously or not, cultural activists. She stated that quite often the literary arts are used as a means of affirming our cultural identities and that, in fact, from the earliest period of Belize's literary development, our writers have, quote, challenged British or foreign dominance, unquote, in a post-colonial era. 
they have done so through themes in their writing as well as through the use of their mother tongue. Secondly, according to a review by Alexandra Sherman in the Journal of Frontiers in Human Neuroscience, the literary arts have an inherent social importance beyond just providing entertainment and enjoyment. Writing and storytelling have, for millennia, been used by societies as a means of passing down information about the world around us. And thirdly, just like the natural sciences, the literary arts have the ability to increase our knowledge and understanding. Even further, they fuel so-called intellectual virtues like empathy and curiosity. And when the literary arts are diverse and inclusive, they help to broaden perspectives and to promote insight. To put it simply, yes, stories do matter. And more importantly, our stories as Belizeans, our literary world matters as well. With that in mind, what exactly does Belize's literary world look like? When we look at the history of literary arts in Belize, and as shown in this graphic by Ms. Ivory Kelly, we see that we have been writing for decades, over a hundred years in fact. When asked in an interview in 1994 how she felt about the state of Belize's literary arts and about the country's role in Caribbean literature, C. Egil said, quote, I think that those who are working at their writing are doing an excellent job. And I do believe that in a few years, there will be a lot of work coming out of Belize. She also pointed out that many might not be able to devote as much time to writing as they would like due to numerous factors, including some economic. Despite those factors, however, and just as the late great Z. Edel stated in that interview so long ago, Belizeans continue to put out work. Undoubtedly, Belize has had and continues to have its fair share of authors, writers, and poets. Still, we have had ebbs and flows in our literary scene. For example, between the years 2008 and 2014, as reported by local media house Seven News, the number of novels published by Belizeans living in Belize was three. Of course, this number has certainly increased since then, especially with the popularization of self-publishing via platforms like Amazon's Kindle Direct Publishing, as well as the creation of established association and the Belizean Writers Guild. Nevertheless, when it comes to having a thriving literary industry, there is still work to be done. In this case, I use the term industry to mean a system where Belizean works, especially poetry, fictional works, and creative nonfiction are being published in whatever way and are being circulated in regions beyond just Belize at some level of consistency. To examine what are some of the challenges faced by the literary world and those in the literary arts in Belize, we look first to a similar case, the island nation of Jamaica. In the study, Issues Hindering the Development of Jamaica's Publishing Industry, which was published in 2017, Jamaica, with a then population of 2.8 million, had a publishing industry, industry challenge by, quote, the small size of the artistic community, minute literary fraternity, and few publishers, literary agents, book designers, and paid speaking engagement, all of which are owed to one common problem, that Jamaica is a small country. So what do we and other nations like us, including Jamaica, need to do in order to thrive? To answer this, I first turn to Suzanne Jansen's study, The Empirical Study of Careers in Literature and the Arts. A thriving literary industry is one in which writers and artists have the support that they need to thrive. Jansen notes, quote, unless they create or perform only for their own pleasure, writers and other artists depend directly or indirectly on the social structures that support their work, end quote. 
The school is beyond just readers and audiences. It includes institutions, agencies, and organizations as well. These institutions can help artists to earn some kind of livelihood or recognition. Support structures, says Jansen, provides avenues for obtaining jobs or commissions and for recognizing talent and innovations. This includes publications, writers associations, creative institutions, and booksellers. From my own research, I have highlighted three of the most important determinants of a thriving literary industry. They are growth in publishing outlets for new writers, including small literary magazines, greater avenues for writers to be celebrated and marketed, for example, via literary festivals, and an increase in focus on the protection of writers' economic and creative rights. In the case of Jamaica, the solution to its stagnant literary industry growth was to join forces, so to speak, with other Caribbean nations, increasing influence as a united region through regional events, including annual literary festivals like Focus Lit Fest and Cari Festa in Trinidad and Tobago. Today, Jamaica has persevered despite its own challenges and even has its own literary festival, the Calabash Literary Festival. And the good news is that even if only in the fledgling states, Belize does have some emerging support systems aimed at helping its writers to thrive. We might not have Cari Festa, but we do have an annual Belize Book Week. When it comes to publishing outlets, the 501 Poets, Bafu Magazine, and Benton Press, to name a few, have all added at some point or the other to the kindling that will hopefully one day become a blaze of publishing outlets for writers in Belize. Furthermore, the existence of entities like Belipo and the Belize Copyright Act show at least some minor forms of consideration for the protection of the creative rights of writers. Belize might still only have its foot in the door when it comes to entering the global literary world, but this does not change the fact that, like Jamaica, our writers and our creators are slowly but surely also finding their place in spaces like Cari Festa, like Bocas Lit Fest, and like many other regional literary events. Just this year, Godfrey Smith's Diary of a Recovering Politician had the honor of making it onto the longest for the OCM Bocas Prize at Bocas Lit Fest. Meanwhile, writers like Ivory Kelly and K.O. The Assassin and others have been participating in regional festivals in both the Caribbean and Latin America. The ultimate goal then would be to keep this momentum going and to increase the visibility of Belizean creators on a regional and international scope. To conclude, I would like to once again thank the Heritage Education Network of Belize for the amazing opportunity and I would like to thank you, the viewer, for your time. If you would like to keep up with my writing endeavors, um, you can follow me on Instagram at kgentlewrites or you can visit my website at kgentlewrites.com. Thank you and have a wonderful day. Thank you, Ms. Kyla, for your efforts in growing the literary arts here in Belize. We are huge fans of your work here at HenB and are excited to see your continued successes. Uh, I'm sure there are plenty of questions about all of these wonderful topics. Speaking of questions, we would like to remind our audience that the question and answer segment is scheduled for the end of each session. So please put your comments and questions in the comment sections on our Facebook or YouTube for our presenters to see and answer. This morning's first session Q&A will start around 9.15, 9.10, 9.15. So get your questions up before then. Uh, our presentation and our final presentation for this morning session is by Ms. Sadie Moore Godet. Sadie Godet is a holder of a bachelor's in history and geography. 
and a master's in education and management from the University of the West Indies. She's also the owner of the Art Shack Belize, an art gallery, marketing, and design company in Belmont Park. Sadie is currently an adjunct lecturer at Galen University and a frequent writer of marketing and business articles for TAS Belize. In 2020, she collaborated with several artists, visual and lyrical, from across the country. This was the beginning of an art gallery in Bamapan, the Art Shack Belize. The gallery has evolved into a home for numerous Belizean local products. Its mission is to support and contribute to the community of artists and crafters by offering quality art pieces and quality supplies to accommodate customer needs, hosting and supporting shows, classes and contests, and promoting Belize as an artist's oasis and destination. We will now watch Ms. Morgadette's art, decoration, or progressive instruments. Hello everyone. Thank you for joining in to view my presentation. My name is Sadie Godet. And today I will be presenting on art, decoration, or progressive instrument. Now, what will we discuss today? We want to dive in today into Belizean heritage depicted, which means bridging the gap, connecting art to heritage. What is the importance of visual arts to the preservation of heritage in Belize? and the sustainability of art, art in the future, the transference of skills. How important or why is it important to transfer these skills to our future generation? And understanding the business of art, applying models from education and understanding that art is not just a hobby, it is a business within this country and should be respected as such. The art world in Belize is a mixing pot, much like the culture of the Caribbean. It surrounds various cultural experiences, socioeconomic experiences. It is used for profit as a business. It's used as a tool for protest and certain social issues. And for many, it's art therapy. So what we will need to understand at the beginning of this presentation is what is art? What are we looking at um, in this particular presentation? We are focusing on the visual arts. So when we're looking at the art of Belize, we're looking at the visual arts and how this particular branch of art can aid in the development of the country as a whole. Is it a viable tool for development? How can we better understand the needs of the artists and how can the artists aid as a result in the sustainability of their economy, of the economy of the country. In 2003, with the announcement of the Convention for the Protection of Intangible Cultural Heritage, visual arts was officially included inside of or noted as important to cultural heritage. It is intangible. It is considered an aesthetic element that signifies harmony, unity, contrast, light, shade. And it also is a representation of the particular culture of the artist. There's a distinctive relationship between our history and the pieces which were created. Now, in terms of cultural preservation, if we were to look around at the various styles and artists that you have in Belize, you would recognize that it is important to respect and to understand them because each artist is coming from a very uh, different viewpoint. If we were to look at the protest art of Alex Sankar, for example, we understand that he takes a more political hardline stance and is protesting against certain social and economic issues. If we were to look at Kelvin Beiser, whose piece is depicted right here, his heritage piece outlines the practices of the Maya people in the background of a Maya temple. Various artists depict their pieces 
and their pieces are a direct representation of their life experiences, their ancestral experiences as well, because what they would have learned was passed down to them and is then shown with this skill, the skill for visual arts. It is depicted. From time immemorial, we have looked to cave drawings to understand what the past was about. Our future generations will look to these paintings to understand what their past was about, which is our present. We hope that in the future, there will be a preservation of culture through the visual arts. Good afternoon, Belize and the world. My name is Kelvin Beiser. I am founder of the Fiction Paintings. Today, the Art Shack Gallery and myself has team up to take us in depth in one of my recent work. The idea is to bring across some of the work entails in getting the, the piece completed, but not only that, but also getting an understanding of why we create these things and what kind of message as an artist we are trying to send. So the painting that I want to go through with you will be the one behind me that is titled In the Company of Gods. What my aim was at the time was trying to bind tourism along with having a local appreciation for our cultural representation. I'm glad to be working on that industry also because art just in a way or another brings everybody together. This is one of my favorite and latest pieces that I have here. And I'm very happy to share it with you guys. I'm a big fan of the Mayan culture and history. So being on the lockdown, I had a lot of time to think about a lot of stuff. And uh, this is one of the ideas that came to my mind. And uh, the colors and everything they were just there and i had to get them on, on the canvas the whole concept of doing this painting it's uh that being locked down you know sometimes we don't really appreciate what we have and what we do so uh i've missed a lot of stuff just for being insecure and not just going for it so i had to bring it here and the idea is that uh if you like what you do, things So this painting is titled Amor al Arte. So it's love for arts. And uh, doesn't necessarily have to be arts, but like everything you do in life, you know. So to make it easier and much fun, you should put a uh, little more love to everything you do. And uh, like I said, I really like the concept of the Mayan culture and everything. So it's a sacrifice. Sometimes you have to sacrifice a lot to get to where you want to go. So uh, put your heart on everything you do. That way it works or it doesn't work. You did it with that passion so there won't be no regrets. And. Uh, I think basically that's that's the whole idea of bringing this to life as you can see during the covid 19 lockdown across the world and in belize there was a rise and development in the artistic world people were looking for outlets to express themselves to tell the stories of their experiences how they were feeling during that period lack of anything anything else to do outdoors push them to explore these different vent ventures. What it did for the art world in Belmopan and across Belize is a lot of artists started to think about sustainability. They started to think about their legacy. What would they leave when they were gone? Would they just leave their art pieces, which anthropologically speaking, can tell a story about your experience and about the culture and society of that time, but were they interested in also sharing that skill, 
creating apprentices as such to ensure that their type of work is sustainable. The consequence of that type of thinking resulted in the creation of a number of art schools and artists taking on students to teach them. And also it created a more communi community oriented movement where artists decided that they wanted to express what society was going through, all their problems, all their successes, and they wanted to do it with students as well. They wanted the students to have their own voice. So case in point would be people like Raquel Art, who created her school out of COVID, one, to ensure that she was able to process what she was feeling, and two, to engage children. Mind you, this was done virtually to, be, to begin with and continued when COVID, the lockdown ended into face-to-face. -face. In Belly City, we have Kirk and Smith as well, who has carried on the tradition of teaching art. Now, all of these things tell us that our heritage is important. It tells us that sustainability is important. It tells us that art is important when we come to processing trauma, processing our experiences. And it is important to tell a story about a particular period that is unique in our lifetime, which is COVID. A number of art pieces were created across Belize by various artists in various forms. We have Tom Sharp creating his abstract pieces, which were darker during that time and lightened up when COVID ended. So in terms of sustainability, that era highlighted the need for it and the importance of the visual art world in Belize. Interactive participation has a distinct advantage in the dissemination of culture, but it also has an advantage connecting you to the community. Social participation, artistic aesthetics, and sharing our diversity are all important, especially when it comes to the visual arts and sustainability, which is the sustainability of our heritage. The case in study is Raquel Art. They have worked uh, to integrate life skills, governance, and art to help children identify and nurture their abilities. And Raquel Art has also had extensive work advantage communities focusing on work on violence, climate change, the environment, mental health, bringing awareness to all of these things. Now, when we think about youth, we need to understand that the utilization of visual arts is extremely important. It helps with trauma, especially for those youth within disadvantaged communities where trauma or traumatic experiences are most high. It helps them to process it. And it also helps in dissemination, the sharing of their experiences. And that, in part, is culture understanding their unique abilities, their, their heritage, their ancestral skills, all of those things are important when we think about sustaining skills and sustaining our heritage. In art-based action research, projects are observed, investigated, planned, and carried out through and using the artistic expression. This technique helps the creative mind discover fresh possibilities for project development. The application of artistic approaches in business brings new viewpoints. It changes the culture of that particular business and offers employees to have an outlet for expression. These techniques are use creative processes as their main mode of inquiry, resulting in a variety of artistic mediums for data collection, analysis, and or presentation of social science research. Now this is speaking about the application in actual research. What the researcher does is draw from a variety of artistic disciplines, including theater, dance, music, visual arts, writing, and textiles, 
The researcher often spends time with people while they engage in various artistic pursuits. They then try to understand the subject's experiences and is informed, the research is therefore informed by this effort. The research becomes more embodied as a result. The process is analyzed and used in the final evaluation of the project. It is being used to study psychological topics such as depression. Here, the, uh, the, a product such as our journal is used to facilitate and inform conversations on topics around mental illness. It can be uh, textile, again, it can be visual arts as well. Research and post-traumatic stress disorder then create and perform a play. For example, in PTSD, they use theater and drama for it. And they draw on personal exp um, experiences. With the audience's reactions and feedback, the use of that data plus the artifact that was created, which is the journal, gives a more embodied research um, project. The researcher then uses the subject's identity by incorporating the use of photography. Participants then reflect on their lives using photographs to create stories and discussions. This is another method. So in terms of art-based research, it gives a wider scope for creativity, but it also gives a richer output in terms of the projects that you can that can be created and the research that can be done to understand one psychology, to improve business productivity, and for general trauma and uh, therapy. So art in research and art in business, in this using this type of method is extremely valuable. To continue a discussion on applying art to business, uh, art-based practices help leaders and teams explore new ideas. It creates more of a collaborative environment within a business, and it engages in aesthetic inquiry. They promote visual literacy, cross-pollinating and cross-pollinating ideas. It reframe, it allows both employee and employer to reframe issues that may have been concerning the company or the business in the past. And with that ability to reframe and to analyze it using art, it can foster new ideas. And it gives a more of a collaborative feeling, it fosters diverse perspectives. It allows the freedom of expression and it does disseminate culture. The person, the employee and the employee's personal culture across the business environment. By integrating artistic and relational intelligence with analytical and operational intelligence, artful reflection and self-discovery can lead to deeper inquiry into matters of importance. For example, if we were to look at a company who has been venturing out into applying more sustainable methods to their business practices, more climate conscious methods to their business practices, by engaging in workshops that have art within that program, it allows your employees to dive deeper into their minds to find new ideas and can result in new projects and programs that can further push that company into the right direction, thereby achieving their version of sustainable development. So why should we invest in art and artists? We spent quite a bit of time talking about art as sustaining your cultural heritage. That's one important reason as to why the visual arts is important in places like Belize especially places that promote tourism like Belize. It gives the persons who are visiting your country a story that is visual. It's also a micro business. Supporting your artists means that you're sustaining the economy and you're sustaining society. It's a viable business and therefore should be respected as such. When bought and placed in businesses or homes, it in 
it can enhance efficiency. Certain businesses have noted that when you place certain types of positive art around their locations, around their offices, it promotes a positive attitude, which then enhances employee efficiency. It also helps promote ownership. Ownership to your culture, ownership to your country, a national pride should you own something from a local artist. It enhances the overall aesthetics of the, the community. If there, there is art, there, there is mural art on the walls. If you own art through, in, within your homes, it also promotes an ownership and a national pride within your actual household. So aesthetically speaking, art is important. In terms of your national pride, art is important. Efficiency, it can drive that. And it is an economically viable option for many people and their skill promotes your country. Therefore, the investment in art and the respect of artists throughout Belize is something that should not be overlooked. And I hope by this presentation, you have greater insight into how important the visual arts is now what it was, how it was important in the past and how it can be important to your future. Thank you for listening to this presentation. A big thank you to Heritage Network for allowing me to have this discussion with you and to the artists who participated. To all the artists in Belize, um, I encourage you to continue creating and to everyone out there, Support the local arts, support your local culture, and thanks again. Thank you, Ms. Morigodat. You can agree more. Support your local artists, support your local culture. And thank you for all of your work to maintain and grow a flourishing art community here in Belize and for featuring the amazing talent of Belizean artists. And thank you to all of our presenters this morning for all of these thought provoking presentations so far. Uh, we will now open the floor to our audience for a live Q&A. Uh, we welcome our presenters to the live stream. All right, welcome, welcome everybody. Uh, so much to think about and uh, to talk about this morning. Uh, we do have quite a few comments so, um, and a lot of love. <laughs> um, so we'll start with Ms. Ella Vakeshi. How would you improve the engagement of Belizean youth in literature? Uh, what are some of the actions we can take right now? This is for Ms. Kaila. Good morning. Um, thank you again to Henby for curating this amazing space. Um, to answer your question, for me, I would say sometimes all it takes is a little nudge. Um, for me personally, that was my grandmother gifting me a book at the age of 12. On the broader scope of things, I think that continued events that are geared towards promoting not just the value of books and the literary arts, but the diversity of it um that would be a great start um because i think engagement comes with accessibility and i think one of the events that really help in increasing accessibility of literature to the youth would be for example belize book week which takes place in april to celebrate world book day it happens at public libraries, which means that it would be more accessible, especially to youth, maybe in marginalized communities. Um, a lot of the times when people think literature, they think more the like the highbrow stuff that you encounter in school. But um, I think that increasing the awareness that there it's such a broad field and there's something out there for everyone is, I think, a great start in promoting um, 
more youth engagement in that world. Absolutely. And I just was thinking about how um, libraries are also pretty essential for hosting events for youth to um, engage with literature in, in so many ways. And I remember when I first moved to Belize uh, during the pandemic, there was a, I think it was like a 24 hour reading uh, marathon for Z Edgel's, I don't remember which, I think it was Becca Lamb or yeah um which was amazing i've never heard of something like that before um and so perhaps that's that's things like that need to happen more and and hopefully virtual spaces can help also uh get people more involved in the literary arts so so yeah um, wonderful perfect um so we will have a question here for dr DeShield and colleagues from miss ali Villarreal. Uh, she says, how is the Ministry of Education supporting your efforts in curriculum reform? Are they entering into the broader conversation as well? So I know my name is mentioned there, but we've got three of us representing our corner of the <laughs> <laughs> presentation yeah. there. Um, so I suppose I could start off just very quickly. Um, Thanks, first of all, for the opportunity. I think the, it's a wonderful space. I want to echo the comments that um, Ms. Gentle mentioned there for the Culture Symposium. Yes. But yes, and thanks for the question, the specific question. So um, how the Ministry of Education supported our efforts. So I, I would probably start by saying the ministry has uh, this effort at curricular reform ongoing. And it sort of prompts our specific engagement here, even though we are invested in, uh, you know, reviewing uh, curricula and education generally. So we're kind of exploring the, the rationale, the sources, the theory, the objectives of that sort of reform and um, attempting to uh, maybe investigate our own positionality here as higher education professionals as teacher educators and situate ourselves in this context. But I can think of um, some specific ways that um, we have engaged with the ministry in regard to curricular reform. Uh, myself and um, Ms. Koye have been um, part of some workshops that the ministry has produced um, and sponsored that have to do with competency-based education specifically. So they have a huge task in resourcing teachers and orienting them to this um, methodology and directly engaging teachers. And we were invited as perhaps part of a small set of um, educators to learn about this um, method, their, um, their efforts yeah. there, and engage them there. Um, so even though I'm, we, us two are not are, are are specifically housed in departments of languages and literature, for instance, we were able to access that. Still, it seemed to be targeted to a kind of specific set of um, educators at in higher education, and so perhaps for this reason, in the curricular documents that we looked at there didn't seem to be much guidance for higher education generally um, regarding mm -hmm. these, these ideas. Because and so this could be seen as an oversight or a challenge here. Um, I think it also represents an opportunity for the university. We have a critical role to play in providing feedback on these initiatives, um, to engage with it, and also to look at some of the proposed reforms, um, to enliven them in a way to establish critical consciousness there and, um, and to cultivate you know, these social change agents I think, in our classroom around these efforts. So, I don't know if my, any of my colleagues want to add to that. Yeah. Morning. Good mo sorry, for, but <coughs> good morning. Okay. I'll just no, go ahead. I'll just add um, for the for the person who asked the question. All of these curricula reform are being driven by the Ministry of Education. They are the ones who created all the best plan, the um, curriculum documents that we looked at. Um, but we thought it really very important that as 
members of the higher education com community that we in you know that we look at this with a little bit more critical eye um, and in terms of what outside educators are saying reform should engage in to be successful so again thanks Henry for the opportunity to present absolutely yeah um, and I guess from my experience it does seem that curriculum reform um, from through the government does sort of focus on um, primary and secondary education right tertiary is sort of um, overlooked sometimes but that as Dr. DeShield mentioned is, is an opportunity right um, to sort of be proactive and, and get more engaged and do the things that you guys are doing. So thank you for, for doing that. And thank you for doing that. So, um, and I want to give a, a question for Ms. Um It looks like Ms. Ali Viral also has a question. Uh, what are the effects of tourism on art uh, as a business, as well as cultural collaboration? Does that fit within the sustainable structure built here? Um, that's a, a wider one. Uh, so it does, let's take it from the second question and then I'll move to the next one. Um, to speak about the sustainable structure built here, um, if you've watched the news recently or not during this course of this year, the orange economy was built for culture and arts, human talent. So it fits in, visual arts fits in within the sustainable structure because they have included it within the economy. It's now noted as a viable part of the economy of Belize. So we've answered that part, the effects of the effects of tourism on art, it has created a very compatible, competitive field, actually. If you go to the Arts Fest, for example, which, which happens in February in Placencia, you will see the vast amount of talent that we have here in Belize. It stretches the entire um, boardwalk there, sidewalk of, of Placencia. And you can see right there what the effects are because of the booming tourism industry. The visual arts have taken on a new identity where they're now pushing harder, artists are pushing harder to produce, to, suit, to meet the needs of what the tourists want. And also with the increase of expats, with people moving to Belize to retire, it has also created a viable industry for arts, for the artists to, you know, decorate their homes. Um, collaborative culture. Um, the only thing that I would say about that is while I, I know that tourism does push the visual arts, there still is a gap there in terms of cultural art. I believe that there should be a little bit more appreciation for cultural art in Belize. I mean, the artists do create cultural pieces, but it takes so long to move those pieces. And it's quite interesting because those are the pieces that tell your story, that tell your history. Right. But if there is a little bit more collaboration, especially between the government with their orange economy initiative and those cultural pieces, then you'll have more sustainability happening. If you have a museum for the cultural arts, then you create a more more sustainable um, industry. You have more collaboration. But right now where we're at, tourism does have a big impact on the arts. Um, when there is low season, the artists struggle a little bit more. And you can see that, like, for example, right now, but when it's peak season in Belize, the arts definitely would be one of those businesses that thrive. Great. Thank you for that response. I, um, I've always been curious as to how tourism really helps art flourish here, because I've observed that tourism, tourists are very interested in purchasing pieces of art from local um, artisans. Um, and I, I guess I'm curious if I can add to that, how um, sort of imported art in, is impacting sort of local art? Um, yeah, if, if um, uh, there is a concern that, mm -hmm. especially in those areas that have the greater presence of tourists, there is an influx of uh, foreign art coming in from Guatemala, Mexico, et cetera, with the name Belize written on it. 
which is quite which which is interesting and i know a couple of artists for example alex sankar who's very vocal on talking about uh social issues right but he did make a video and he said about he he was quite correct in that it does water down um the effect of art here and the appreciation for art because when you can get those things cheap which are not Belizean, you tend to bypass the more original pieces that would cost a little bit a little bit more even again at the Placencia sidewalk arts fest we found a lot of foreign art there with the words yeah. belize on it and it 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 you know people were buying it and i'm not saying that we shouldn't have foreign pieces in the country what i'm saying is that it, it waters down the effect of the appreciation for the local talent that you have here so yeah, yeah. absolutely i'm wondering yeah. if there are policies that can be put into place to prevent i mean obviously like you said we don't want to completely prevent it but um it would be nice to have policies to encourage more local art to be well that would call for a more structured approach to the art industry i think with the orange yeah. economy it has a broad heading where it visual arts falls into that but if we have a more structured conversation with the local artists being engaged in that conversation then perhaps policies can come into play especially with the amount that's coming in and you know and what is being done in terms of taxes etc then you will you will kind yeah. of get down there I wonder, um, just to join the conversation here, because I find this topic also very fascinating, and I can see a link between our own efforts um, when we're reviewing, for example, the curricular reforms that, um, uh, that the ministry uh, been pushing here in Belize, we noticed that you know, these are global reforms that lots of different countries are considering to adopt so that um, there's a sort of a homogenizing force um, that's at risk here. I can see a similar pattern when uh, Ms. Um, Godet is, is talking about uh, the art. When you go to certain areas like art spaces that are marketed for tourists, I notice that a lot of people are selling similar like uh, types of hats and sarongs that are sort of Indonesian art in origin. And it's interesting that you can find these things in all spaces all around the world. Nothing distinctive about this because it's like a tourist type product um, and then you do not get Belize's specificity uh, on display there at all and it's so strange that that would be such a homogenizing force globally um, so it's an interesting connection that you know curriculum reforms can be packaged in a homogenizing way in the same way that you can have some kind of placeless art products um, I guess that's <laughs> yep yeah there, there's definitely it, it tells about the art, right? about the um the mass production it, it once you see that happening you know that that is not original that is not unique to a particular place um but unfortunately price pays, plays a, a a very important role in those things when you're purchasing for example a very unique piece that's cultural can take you up to things a price like five thousand dollars you don't want to pay that some people don't want to pay that they want to pay 30 for a hat that was created in Guatemala. Um, so again, monitoring, taxing, better policies, more engagement with the artists, those are the things that are still outstanding to create a more strategized approach to what uh, the future of visual arts could be. I just had a thought uh, perhaps like B2B marketing towards actual tourism to get them to be more, I guess, sustainable tourists uh, could could also aid in something like that, right? Um, conscious tourism is is kind kind of growing, I think. Um, to to be more mon like conscious of the impacts you're having on local communities as you're traveling, things like that. Um, so perhaps perhaps that's something for me to be <laughs> also to think about, right? Um, so I really want to continue these conversations. They're so um, uh, engaging and, and interesting, but we are already over time uh, somehow, even though we started a bit early. So um, I'll just remind our presenters that we are, there are more questions in the comments. I see some from Mr. Obad Guerra. Good morning, Mr. Guerra. Um, uh, Alisi Chun. Um, so uh, if you have some free time after, 
I would encourage you to go onto Facebook and YouTube to respond to those questions if you can. Um, and I also want to thank you all so, so much for uh, using Henby as a platform to feature your amazing work and let us know if we can help support you in any way in the future. Um, uh, we, we are really grateful to have you here. So um, at this time, I will say that we will break for coffee and um, after around 9.45, we will come back for our next session um, and we will see you then. Okay, so thank you. Enjoy your coffee break and we'll see you in a bit. Bye everyone.
Sylvia. I, we can't hear you. Sorry. I just wanted to, sorry, technical issues. So I just wanted to let you know we couldn't hear you. Hello everyone, um, apologies for the technical issues. I'm going to be taking over from Sylvia um, while she is fixing her uh, microphone. So welcome back to our session. Welcome back from the coffee break. We hope um, you were able to refresh yourselves and are ready for some more exciting uh, presentations. A gentle reminder to our audience that um, we will have live Q&A session and segments uh, with the presenters at the end of the sessions. So ask your questions um, in the comment sections, either on Facebook or YouTube, and we will be uh, putting them up on the screen and uh, discuss them. Um, we also want to take this time to remind anyone who appreciates the work it takes to put together this symposium that our organization is a non-profit entity so please consider donating so that we can make more events like this possible um, you can find uh, donation links on our website at uh, www.heritagebelize.org forward slash donate and just to continuing on with our presentations um, this morning uh, we will be taking a diverse look at the ways that the ancestral Maya have left legacies for us today to better build a resilient society and future. And from ancient environmental management, uh, plant and forest knowledge to um, language and writing, we will now have a session focused on indigenous legacies for resilient future. Without Further ado, um, opening up our second morning session are uh, Professor Brownman Whitney and Dr. Rebecca Fidel Kwan and also Dr. Samantha Kraus. Um, a little bit about the presenters. Professor Brownman uh, Whitney is a tropical paleontologist who specializes in broadening our understanding of the impact of climate change and human activity in tropical forests and savanna over past centuries and millennia. She specializes in pollen and charcoal as indicators of past, past plant and fiber management and has researched the interaction of people and their landscapes in the tropical south in Central America and beyond. And her research in Belize investigates how the ancient Maya managed their forests and savanna resources and how they may have adopted their management strategies in response to uh, climate change. Um, our other presenter, Dr. Rebecca Fidel Juan, is a postdoctoral researcher at El Colegio de la Frontera Sur, uh, where she is uh, investigating ancient human environmental dynamics in the Maya region. Um, she has conducted community outreach as a director for the organization's Fajina Archaeology Outreach and our very own Heritage Education Network Belize. And her research takes an interdisciplinary approach to understanding histories of human plant relationships. Um, Dr. Sam Krause um, is an assistant professor at Texas State University in the Department of Geography and Environmental Studies. Um, her research focuses on soil geomorphology and paleoenvironmental change of the Holocene. Um, she has contributed to geoarchaeological projects in Central America, the Mediterranean, and in the U.S. Southwest. The U.S. Southwest. Um, so we will now hear for, uh, from them about ancient environmental dynamics informing the resilience and sustainability of Belize. Bronwyn Whitney, I'm a professor of physical geography at Northumbria University, and I'm here to speak on behalf of Dr. Rebecca Friedel Wan and Dr. Samantha Kraus on our topic of an ancient environmental dynamics and its 
relevance for Belize. Thank you to the organization. from the region, but more importantly, talk about its relevance for Belize, for Belizean uh, culture and heritage. Hello, all. My name is Bronwyn Whitney. I'm a professor of physical geography at Northumbria University, and I'm here to speak on behalf of Dr. Rebecca friedel Wan and Dr. Samantha Krauss on our topic of an ancient environmental dynamics and its relevance for Belize. Hello everyone. Apologies for the technical difficulties. It seems like the the um, IT gods are not in our favor today. Um, so until the people in the back are trying to fix the um, the problem, let me just uh, remind you that um, we will have a Q and A session at the end of uh, of um, the presentations. And please make sure to submit your questions, feel free to submit your questions in the Facebook and um, YouTube comment section, and we will be bringing them up to the screen and you will be able to address them. Ooh. It looks like our team is trying to uh, figure out the issue. So until that happens, um, let me take a few moments. All right, the team says that it's supposed to be ready. so. Um, please enjoy the presentation. Hello all, my name is Bronwyn Whitney. I'm a professor of physical geography at Northumbria University. And I'm here to speak on behalf of Dr. Rebecca friedel Wan and Dr. Samantha Krauss on our topic of an ancient environmental dynamics and its relevance for Belize. Thank you to the organizer for allowing me to speak today. Uh, just a brief overview of the lecture. I plan to describe what environmental change is, uh, why and how we do it. I want to give some brief examples from the region, but more importantly, talk about its relevance for Belize, for Belizean uh, culture and heritage, some opportunity for furthering research and education in Belize. So to begin, I'm going to use this word quite frequently, paleo, and paleo simply means ancient. And so I'm a paleo scientist, as is Rebecca and Sam, and we look at past environmental change. So basically an ancient perspective, a longer term perspective that gives us an understanding of the environmental records beyond what we have recorded or maybe even have an oral history. So it can give us an understanding of what happened hundreds and thousands of years ago, 
and using environmental, uh, paleo environmental approaches, we can reconstruct or put back together, I guess, uh, different components of the environment, past environmental change. So for example, we can use diatoms, which are unicellular algae that are preserved in environmental archives to reconstruct hydrological change to the past. I'm a paleoecologist, so I use pollen as a marker of how vegetation has changed. And there are some examples here given below. But I'm going to give you a brief overview to begin with um, the applications for uh, paleo environmental science. And one of the reasons why we do this is to understand what are anthropogenic activities, so human activities in the environment through time, and what are natural climate drivers of, um, of in change, for example. We might want to look at why um, land cover has changed in the past and what might be considered to be natural versus unnatural land cover and what that means for conservation. It can give us an understanding how fire has changed. And of course, in the news this year, there have been significant and devastating fires in tropical and subtropical regions. So one of the things that we like to look at as well is understanding how fire has changed through time and whether or not these patterns that we're seeing now are driven entirely by climate, or is there something we can do for land management that might help? Also, um, paleo-environmental science can help us with conservation ecology, understanding, again, what worked and what doesn't necessarily work through time. The methods that we use, as I pointed out briefly before, is that we look at cores in the environment, such as Uh, so sediments at the bottom of lakes accumulate through time, and in it they trap environmental signals that reflect the environment at the time that it was deposited. And those signals are likely to be microfossils or chemical changes. Equally, if you can stand on top of the surface, such as in a uh, swamp, like a palm swamp, you can take a core from that surface as well. And so we'll often look at swamps and peatland cores. Um, one of the things that's relevant for Belize is cave records. So things like um, these stalac um, stalagmites, sorry, um, they grow incrementally through time and they also capture records of what the climate was like at the time that they were deposited. So using these methods, we analyze um, how past envi environments have changed. So to provide a few examples from Belize, um, we, starting with the speleothem records or cave records, you can see in a bit more detail where you've got, these, these records, by the way, are not from police, but they, they've been provided by a colleague. Um, uh, but you can see how the layers uh, incrementally um, accumulate through time, and within those are those signals of, of growth layers. So for the examples in Belize, um, if we combine cave records and lake records together, we can look at paleoclimate from both Belize and the broader region. So this is shown by a paper that Sam was involved in, and you can see the triangles um, across the Yucatan Peninsula represent points where we have paleoenvironmental records. And so those, for example, will show uh, droughts that happened in various points in ancient Maya history, particularly from the late terminal classic to post classic. And by comparing those records to the archaeology in the region, for example, we can see where people have controlled water um, as part of management strategies to uh, mitigate perhaps against some droughts in the past. Um, I'm more of a paleoecologist, so I study past ecology through time. And the way that we do that is by looking at lake and swamp records and the pollen um, that is produced by plants being trapped in the bottom. Now this little cartoon here represents northern European style vegetation, but the principles are very much the same, that when you go further back through time down into the core, you get different relative abundances of different pollen types, and that tells us what the vegetation was like through time. So in this example, you've got lots of little blue dots, which are supposed to represent spruce pollen, and they become less abundant compared to the other types of plants that come in through time, such as the beech and the chestnut, shown through here. 
And we use the exact same methods in Belize. Obviously, it's a much more diverse country in terms of biodiversity, so it's a little bit more complicated, but we, we as I point out, we use the same methods. The problem is, is that particularly when it comes to communicating um, paleo-environmental change, is that the standard presentation of results can be actually quite difficult to, to view. I mean, this is how we would present our pollen data through time, and it's just showing the relative abundance of different types of plants in these different curves. But you can sh at least understand that there's change happening within this diagram. You can see where certain colors are going up and certain colors are going uh, down through time, and time is represented here on this y-axis. So rather than going through all of this uh, record, talking about this graph, which is quite tricky to see, I'm going to give you an example with New River Lagoon and uh, Lamini. So the, the temple site of Lamini, which is right next to the New River Lagoon, and discuss um, what changes we've seen there in paleoecology. So again, uh, you're probably familiar with, of course, all the New River Lagoon, and we have two cores from this region, one from right next to the temple site, and one that's further south, but a kilometer further south towards um, the, the settlement of Indian Church. And these are lake sediment cores where we analyzed pollen in them, and there's some more work currently being done both um, by uh, So in paleo climate and, and uh, signals of chemical change as well that are happening at this that, that we hope to get out soon. Um, but the published record so far shows that um, there's a lot of really interesting land use changes that happen across the ancient Maya period. And particularly we see in the very early period of Maya settlement that there's some forest cleared and crop cultivation begins in the really early pre-classic period. So we're talking about 3,000 years ago. And then rather than full clearance continuing, which we see in some records of the ancient Maya world, in this particular part, we actually see palm management beginning. So a whole lot of palms begin into, come into the record. And this lasts from the pre-classic right through to the post-classic, this intensification of land use through periods of known drought, but people are growing palms. They're using agroforestry practices, and it's really quite interesting and not really often seen in, in, um, in a lot of pollen records. To get into the colonial period, the land use changes associated with colonization, we see palm land management ending and, and also forest and pine regrowth in certain areas. But we have cultivation for, of uh, maize and various other crops throughout the entire record happening here. Now, this is the record that's next to the temple site. If we then move uh, a little bit further south towards uh, the settlement of Indian Church, our record picks up here in this period where we have the early to post-classic signal. So it overlaps here in time frame, and we see a very similar scenario where there's pines that have been cut throughout the savanna for use, um, and there's intensive land use, and again, a lot of palm cultivation. But then we see this very slow change throughout the post-colonial period as people are no longer so much focused at the temple site, but they're actually further south and they are continuing with palm cultivation, though a little bit less, but we see a, a diversity increase and we think perhaps people are doing more of a forest garden uh, style of cultivation in the post-classic period here. Finally, with the colonization period, and particularly during the British period, we see the end of some of these practices and also the timber trade extraction happening um, in the savannas, um, which is clearly an indication of, of that sort of um, extractive resource industry. In the late 20th century, with Belizean independence, uh, we have the establishment of the Lamini Reserve and some of the highest biodiversity in the record. So our key findings from Belize is that we see resilience and adaptation in the land use practices in response to climate change across a lot of this record of, um, of you know, the ancient Maya uh, civilization, almost near 
continuous cultivation of the forest soils, not on the savanna side, but on the forest side throughout the entire records. People are always growing things, and they're shifting a little bit of how they're doing it, where they're doing it. Um, and interestingly, as I pointed out, we see these agroforestry practices of palm cultivation that is happening through most of this record, and it simply shifts away from the temple site during the post-classic period. Now, why are we so interested about why this is relevant for Belize in the modern day? Well, of course, this is part of Belizean cultural heritage. The environment is, and how people manage it, is in fact part of that, that heritage. And we're interested as a group in valuing and promoting this, this um, heritage, this environmental heritage of Belize. It also shows us potentially sustainable management practices in the past. We can look at what Belize do during periods of change, and that might make us think about what might be useful in the future. Uh, it's really um, important for the conservation of the natural environment because without knowing what is actually human interventions in forestry versus what is natural, um, we, we can't necessarily have a good test for um, uh, how we might conserve something. Or sorry, we might not have a good management strategy for conservation. So we have to know what is natural and what is human. And, and um, preserving some of those human interventions is necessary where they work. Um, it also gives us an idea of testing models, uh, potential models for sustainable development, um, and under understanding the response of different um, systems under different human and climate pressures. Uh, it also gives us a chance of looking at extreme environmental events, so potentially storm frequency, um, patterns of historical drought. Didn't get into this so into great detail, but these are the sorts of things that we can also probe using paleo science and paleo background. Of course, however, we have some um, barriers to this research in Belize as well as some opportunities. And I'll start with, you know, some some of the barriers are that paleo science is mostly mostly taken undertaken by scientists from outside Belize, and this is for a variety. This I guess stems from a variety of reasons, but it doesn't. It shouldn't stay this way. I mean, those reasons are that. You know, mostly expensive laboratory facilities are, are needed. It can be quite expensive and time consuming as far as research is concerned. So the research intensive universities from outside the country have historically been a bit more involved in doing this. Um, the, but, uh, you know, we also have some unmet capacity in teaching and learning in this particular style of, of um, science in these. We also have a problem that we make our papers communicated through um, scientific tools, and that can be pretty inaccessible to the general public. So as a group, what we'd like to see is to start to address this inequality, to consider how we can do better and broader communication of findings across a range of different levels of uh, governance and educational organizations in Belize how we can better build research collaborations with archaeologists, but more importantly, local universities and communities to bring in perspectives of Belizeans into research design, uh, creation, and dissemination. And also the really big one at, at, at present is to try to build more capacity in education in paleo science in, in Belize. So what is happening? Um, well, some of us <laughs> tried to make a bit of a start. Um, I had some undergraduate students visit me in, from Galen as part of uh, a project to begin to build capacity in education and to start with a knowledge exchange with Galen. Uh, we're exploring opportunities to build better um, education capacity, both at Galen University, but also through other research organizations. And this is certainly something that Rebecca is, is building upon, uh, including plans to uh, include paleoecological education at, at, at community events through this, the um, Heritage Education Belize. Um, but, you know, this is going to be a long road, and certainly suggestions and thoughts are very welcome. So thank you to all, and I will leave it there. Thank you so much for this amazing presentation. Um, as many might know, I worked at Lamanai, so it was very interesting for me to um, listen in on some of the results that you had from the area. 
and continuing our presentations on um, indigenous legacies for resilience um, and for a resilient future um, is that of Dr. Uh, Annabelle Ford and Ms. Cynthia Ellis Topsy. Uh, the academic research developed by Dr. Ford focuses on topics that incorporate relations between humans, um, human beings and the environment, complex societies uh, and pre-industrial economies, uh, strategies for the conservation of the forest and cultural heritage, uh, Maya traditional knowledge, sustainability with climate change and use of the natural resources um, and many other topics. Uh, community outreach projects um, are the domain of the nonprofit organization exploring solutions past to promote the values of the Maya forest and the exchange and succession of knowledge on forest management. Uh, Cynthia Alice Topsy, also known as um, Luba Fuisieni, is currently ambassador at large for the Garifuna Nation. Her work has embraced El Pilar with Dr. Annabel Ford to focus on unraveling the wealth untold of archaeology under the canopy of the rainforest. Um, in partnership with Dr. Ford, um, Cynthia charts a path of honoring indigenous knowledge and practice intentionally as part of a succession strategy. Um, so we will now hear from Dr. Ford and Ms. Alice Topsy on the language of the Maya forest. Greetings. Um, I'm Annabelle Ford, and I'm with mm, Narciso Torres and Cynthia Ellis. And we are Topsy. going, and then we are going to discuss today not just the heroes of the Maya forest, but how the language of the Maya forest can actually help us um, in both our future uh, sustainability, sovereignty, and our care of the planet. And um, I'm an archaeologist. I'm a, a forest gardener. And I'm a community activist. And we work together. Uh, we work together at a, uh, at a project, what we call Exploring Solutions Past. And um, my experience, which is not a farmer and uh, more in academia, uh, is has dissected in a way that we want to want to uh, expose here. Um, one of the big problems we're facing with climate change is how to reduce temperature, how to build biodiversity, how to encourage more for soil fertility, not encourage, but actually practice soil, uh, making the soil fertile, conserving water, one of the more important factors, and inhibiting erosion, things that we see around the globe, and especially in the Maya forest and in our country of Belize. Um, to actually in, engage with these, we need to be able to observe um, what is happening. We need to um, have the skills to um, understand how to address what's happening and we have to practice it. And um, I think that these have overarching um, uh, potentials, both in forest gardening and in people. Mm. How, do, how do you, how, how, I mean, you've been working 40 years um, uh, with me and, uh, didn't start it. Uh, well, I, I see that um, all those um, um, practices and um, skills and and um, observation observation uh, is part of of, a, of of the key of um, making our our planet or or our environment um, more more healthier and more um, um, better for, for all, I guess is um, we need to try to be more more um, loving to Mother Earth because um, Mother Earth feeds us all, give us everything, but we need to try to make water safety and, and um, try to 
lower the temperature of, of, of this uh, climate change and then um, try to, to, um, to make the, the earth more fertile. Uh, doing 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 it the organic organic um, organic way to to uh, to uh, preserve water and and to uh, to uh, stop erosion that um, is um, affecting our our streams and rivers um, uh, and probably the sea too that uh, maybe have a have something that uh, make the sea rise, live, live rise too, by having erosion go into the sea. Yeah, I, that's uh, that's all critical. Yes, and how, how does that help uh, people? It's very beautiful that we have the opportunity and the blessing to learn from the treasures of the the Maya, the ancient Maya who had these practices long ago and who have addressed the issues of climate change in their own way. Uh, for example, as human beings, we can learn from nature recommendations as our brother, um, gardener, master gardener, Alfonso Zul would say, the plants recommend themselves. And so we as people can recommend ourselves in uh, our appreciating the wealth untold of the forest, of the trees, of the animals, of everything that has been offered to us that has not been told, wealth untold. And therefore, as we are moving forward in this trio, we need everyone, we need every single plant. And it has something to do with understanding the timing of the recommendation and how to have the, the discernment or the patience uh, to be able to know that we don't just remove a plant because it is not convenient at a particular time, for example. Yeah, we have an example of that. I was growing a bunch of Maya forest trees, and uh, I, I saw uh, an almond tree, which I know is not native to the Maya forest, and I had I felt that we had too much of it. And I said, uh, we were working together, Narciso and I, and I said, let's take that out. And he said, absolutely, that goes out. But two weeks later, it was still there. <laughs> and I said to Narciso, but it's still there, not to worry. It was still there. Now I was, with, this was all happening in, in the April, May um, dry season. And finally, when I said it the third time, I mean, it takes me a little while. Uh, Narciso gently said, Annabelle, it's the dry season. <laughs> so what, what was it doing? What was that plant doing? Why should I be concerned? Why should I observe that it's the, the dry season? What was happening there? Well, um, having the knowledge and skills of um, watching um, plants in, in, in dry season, I think uh, we we need to consider um, the the temperature and and then we uh, and fertility both. and then the, then the then fertility and plant will, will um, conserve water and um, keep the soil in, in place not to have um, erosion. I guess uh, we we. Um, have to be more conscious about uh, what time we could uh, cut up, get rid of a plant that uh, we don't. Sorry. I don't. I don't. I, I won't say we don't need them. We need our plants because our plants will, will um, are doing something great for humanity. For example, in um, turning carbon dioxide into oxygen, and um, I believe that we need to get more conscious about that part. What does that story tell you? I think that um, the respect, honor, and love for the earth and the wealth untold. Um, our national uh, motto is under the shade we flourish. And that is a very powerful motto in terms of we as human beings appreciating the importance of trees. 
I remember one time Dr. Torres and I were at El Pilar and suddenly he stopped me and he said, um, wait, wait, wait. I'm like, what happened? <laughs> you know? He said, there are cedar trees, seedlings all over in this small area. And he and I sat and we we were able to appreciate count 750 seedlings. And it so it was, was like so a, it was like a nursery. Absolutely, absolutely. And it was such a beautiful carpet, you know. So as long as we as um citizens, as world citizens, appreciate the what nature is offering to us, the the word poverty does not exist in our lives, you know. So I really appreciate that we can interweave. It's weaving, we are weavers. Mm -hmm. Weaving in the science from the university, the science from the yes. practitioner, the master forest garden, citizen scientists, and the science of us as human beings appreciating and loving the way how nature teaches us to love. Yeah, I think observation is sort of the 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 key. It's both what you're talking about, kindness among people, observing what people need. And it's really something I've learned so much from uh, from Narciso, uh, how he observes. When I walk with him at El Pilar, I'm always amazed at just the kinds of things that can show up. Uh, I'll pass something, and that will be evidence where the Tepesquintli nod the, uh, was was there. One of my most remarkable observation uh, experience with. Narciso's observation is that we were going in a steep downhill with lots of, um, I call it duff, but I don't, it's, it's piles of leaves. And there were these big holes in, in the leaves as we're going down. And Narciso says the taper was here. Now, I just thought that that was, uh, uh, you know, an interesting thing. But when we got down to the flat, we disturbed the taper and it was like a earthquake. But he already knew he already had observed that the taper was there. Mm -hmm. Was it a surprise to you that we got in that earthquake? Um, yeah, I, I never um, had that experience before, but uh, but you I knew that um, that uh, I, because of the truck that I saw there, I I I, I saw that it was very fresh, and I I never know that the animals were so close, but it was. Um, a surprise for us when we got uh, a little bit closer and the animal started to run and then the, uh, um, great experience for me because um, I I never saw the animal but we we could hear him running away from from it. Well, thankfully he w w ran away instead of towards us. Yes, exactly. I think that that's a big animal. It's, uh, quite large. <laughs> The but respect I'm... and the love for nature is um, very powerful, and I uh, appreciate your presence in water. And uh, we were recently at a, a gathering where the water and the river was being honored. Uh, it's life that is given to us, and as human beings, we give that respect. When we give that respect and love, to water it changes the energy in the environment. And what really touched me in uh, this gathering of the Indigenous People Summit is the reference that we are water, that we as human beings have mostly water. I know? think we're 90%. Yes. Like so it is a beautiful image. And as we have that respect for the need for water and connecting with water, then we take care of the water. I think forest. that one of the kinds of things that we can talk about water in practice is um, if you want to be in uh, in a cool area, you go under the shade of the of the um, flora. Yeah. Uh, if you want so to, uh, if you want to dry your clothes, you don't mm -hmm. put them in the shade; you put mm -hmm. them in the sun. So, right. our natural knowledge mm -hmm. tells us where we're going to have you know, lower temperature, more conservation of water, yeah. or higher temperature to dry our clothes. Right. I think that we're not talking about things that are mysteries. Yesterday, we went to the Malcolm um, X Center 
in Omaha, Nebraska, and we were able to go into a shade, like a sacred space, like what Narciso has of his farm. All I could think about is that special place of shade that has been um, shaped by the trees and the rocks were there for us to sit on in the same way. Mm -hmm. So what I appreciate in this conversation is the, the global uh, linkages that we have. And this is not just for Belize, it's for the world. How we can appreciate and love nature and love one another. And I think the way we do that are with the same skills and practice right. and observation that yeah. we're taught that, that actually becoming a forest gardener and having forest gardens in your backyard, in your ranch, in your spaces will help us in observing what is changing. Like yeah. I've heard people talk about how the the brook de dry, you know, the mm -hmm. the brook has run dry because the they cleared the forest, mm -hmm. you know, or they cleared the the shade around it. And we, it, it, as you say, we need water and the skill to recognize how to pick the right things to remove or to keep, mm. and the practice, uh, very, very important, a practice of, of kindness, of, of knowing the earth, and of mm. taking science and interweaving it. Well, well, my um, as, uh, my point of view is about the uh, conserving water, and. Um, and damaging the 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 banks of streams and rivers or getting rid of trees um are, are not so for me it's something that it's hurting hurting in the environment and hurting us humans because by getting rid of trees on the banks of rivers or or streams we are causing erosion and uh, taking away uh, places for animals to uh, live. Taking, taking away habitat from uh, the science, animals. That science are... tells us that those places that you're talking about hold 50% of the biodiversity of birds. And if you remove that, where do they go? Yeah, the, the animal, animals are like us. They need a, a place to live to because they, if this earth um, loses them, Biodiversity, I think we are not going the right way. Can you bring up a wonderful closing? Yeah, I believe that um, water biodiversity is all very important for human beings. It affects all of us around the world. About the work of the Maya Forest Garden and Gardeners is Narciso's tenacity not to um, have chemicals and um, because chemicals cause pollution in our water and the food that we drink, eat and drink. And that is what we need to like take care of each other by taking care of the earth and taking care of the forest and loving and embracing our rainforest. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for this amazing conversation. I'm really looking forward to having you in the Q&A section to um, continue and for you to give us your, uh, your insights a bit more. And closing our second morning session is uh, Mr. Jorge de Leon. Uh, Mr. Jorge de Leon's friends call him Lion and he has been guiding for almost two decades. He specializes in Maya hieroglyph writing and Maya numbers um, and Maya calendars. Uh, he founded the Maya Writing Club and has been teaching the beautiful art of hieroglyphic writing for several years. He's also the president of the Cayo Tour Guide Association and has been part of um, a couple of projects in collaboration with Niche, one of which is the Stella that is, sits in Belmopan at the Niche headquarters. Um, it was a privilege for him to work with uh, Christoph uh, Hamke in designing and drawing the glyphs uh, for this project. And he believes it is time to retake the task of giving back the ability of reading and writing Maya hieroglyphs to our people. 
We will now hear from Mr. De Leon on the rebirth of the Maya writing system. All right, hello. My name is Jorge De Leon. I, I'm a tour guide. I'm the founder of the Maya Writing Club. And today I'm here to share with you one of the, one of the projects that I've been involved with for probably the past eight years. And what I want to do today is fill you in on what has been happening with my project, with our project. So what I've been doing is we've been teaching Maya writing through all Belize. And, you know, we've been working with Mount Carmel High School. We've done some workshops with Secret Heart Junior College. We've done workshops with the with University of Belize. Um, and several communities, several Maya communities in the southern part of Belize, including Tumulkin. And the host of culture of Porozal, host of culture of Tenque Viejo, and the host of culture of San Ignacio. So, um, you know, and our objective is to share the, right, the Maya writing system with our Belizeans. And we've been doing it, and we've been showing people how to apply the writing system, the Maya hieroglyph system, to their language. And we've been doing it, applying it to, to the English language. Now, after introducing it um, to our Belizeans, I think it's time to take it one step further. So today, I want to let you in on, a, on my project. I want you to be part of this project. So I'm looking for partners. And what I want to do is I want to reach out to as many Maya communities that, as we can. And I want to go there and teach them how to apply the writing system, the Maya hieroglyph system, to your language. So I want to reach out to the Mopan Maya speakers and teach you how to apply it to your language. The Yucatec Maya speakers, how to apply the hieroglyphs to your language. And then the Kekchi speakers, and apply the Maya hieroglyphs to your language. Now, how are, or the dynamics of how this is going to work, I, I envision this introducing or reintroducing to some of the communities that we've already done workshops with. Um, teach them how it works and then have them apply the hieroglyph system to their language and start a pen pal type of an activity and then take that letter and and send it to another Maya speaker. So if it's in, written in Mopan language, we send it to a Mopan speaker, Yucatec speaker to a, to a Yucatec speaker, a Kekchi speaker to a Kekchi speaker. So eventually the, the written language will be applied to your language. The hieroglyphs to your language, right? The spoken language to the written language. And before you know it, we will have households that are not only sending one written letter on Maya hieroglyphs, but you might get two letters because your son will look at you doing it and he might want to start to write. Your neighbor, your brother, your cousin. And before you know it, we might have a complete community writing hieroglyphs, sending letters. And there would be another community somewhere in Belize that are receiving these hieroglyph texts and are sending or replying to these hieroglyph texts. And if we have that, if that starts to happen with the Mopan Maya, with the Kekchi Maya, with the Yucatec Maya, it's not only bringing back the writing system, but now we're also, because of the writing system that we're going to start to do and teach our kids, that will also motivate our children and those Mopan Maya, Yucatec Maya, and Kekchi Maya that are not fluent in speaking the language to start speaking their language. So we're going to, as we say in Belize, we kill two birds with one stone. We kill two birds with one stone. So um, I need to... I need you to reach out to me. I need you to be part of this project because the project is not mine. This project is ours. 
you know, and if we're able to do it and pull this off, I think great things will happen to our communities, great things will happen for Belize, you know. So, um, in addition to this project, there's another project that we've begun a, a while back, and it was a project that um, I got one of my friends involved. Uh, his name is Christoph Helmke, he's an epigrapher. So together we've been, we've already started to put together a manual. It's a Maya hieroglyph writing manual that we want to use for this project. So while I'm introducing the system to our Maya speakers, I'll be simultaneously working on this book. Hopefully that by the time the book is finished, we have enough Maya people, Maya speakers, using the system already and then it's going to be an easy introduction of the manual of the book to have a more standardized method of writing and hieroglyphs for us to use and one of the cool things about it is and is that Mopan and Yucatec language have a lot of similarities and differences with the Kekchi language so our manual will be specifically for our three Maya languages that we have and so right now we're working on the syllabary and we're gonna have hieroglyphs to produce the sounds that are commonly used today by these languages because Maya language or any language evolves so from the pre, from the pre-classic to the classic period language evolved and from the classic period Maya language that was being spoken and written it has evolved to what our maya are speaker speaking today so we need to create a syllabary or produce a syllabary that is going to be user friendly it will be easy for our, our yucatec um, speakers to use and it will produce sounds that we don't have glyphs for so that's going to be our challenge and that's we're working on that but as we work on that, um, our people could start to learn the basics of the system. Um, so we're going to be introducing the system. And then when the book is ready, then we can go for it and then just incorporate it and start working with it. So that is what we want to do. Um, so I'm excited. I'm super excited for this project. I, I'm looking for partners, so I'm looking for partners in the form of NGOs, um, youth groups, cultural groups, uh, I, I want to with, with Niche, um, we've collaborated with them in previous years, um, celebrating Museum Week, celebrating uh, Archaeology Day and Archaeological Fairs. So we've been reaching out and sharing the, the art of Maya writing. And now it's time to take it one step further. So I want to ask you to join me and make this dream a reality. And, you know, we can together one day have our speakers read and write Maya hieroglyphs. So, you know, I don't know what else to say, but thank you for listening. Thank you for being part of this project. Reach out to me. Um, I'll have my, my email will be right there. You can reach out to us. Uh, my number is 0501-611-2909. Um, I have WhatsApp on that number. Um, contact us and we'll get together. We'll, we'll take the workshop to you. And you know, let's, let's bring back this part of our heritage, right? So I want to thank the organizers, Henby, thank you. I want to thank, thank you know, everyone who has made my journey understanding this system possible. You know, um, so thank you, thank you all very much. And, you know, I'm really hoping to hear from you. So have a wonderful day. And I look forward to your, to your contacting me. And if you have any questions, please, you know, we're here to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. De Leon, for this amazing um, presentation.
And thank you for all the uh, presenters for highlighting and sharing such diverse topics that are so relevant to, um, to present day life. Um, and without further ado, I think we will now open the floor to our audience uh, and open our live Q&A session. So uh, let's welcome our presenters to the stream. Hello, everyone. Thank you for Hi. Thank you for coming. Hello, good morning. We have quite a few um, questions in the um, in the Q and A um, session. Let's tackle the first one. Um, it is from Erin Ray, and it's asking: In the New River Lagoon record, are you able to see pre land clearing, or is the earliest part of the record already already showing land clearing? Very interesting. Um, th thanks, Aaron, for your question. Um, the very simple answer is no. Uh, it simply doesn't go far back enough in order to, to show some of those very early human interventions into the forest. But I'd also argue <laughs> that um, there's not really any forest signal that you're ever going to get if you go back far enough where you're not going to see human intervention. So these forests arrived, you know, in the present form sometime about 10,000 years ago at the end of the last ice age. And since then, people have been altering them in some way. We see maize uh, in, in records, understandably, very early on. So it's in a short question, it's, well, actually, no, we do see some fairly um, heavy impact, particularly around the temple sites, because you have to clear in order to build a temple. I mean, that's that's fairly, you know, straightforward. But um, uh, so we do see a bit of that, but uh, what happened beforehand, how people were changing things, how people were using the forest for themselves, we don't have that particular um, bit of a record. So there's a simple answer, and then there's the slightly complicated one. <laughs> but thank you for that. Yes, I, I wonder. If, I just, oh, go ahead. Yes, sorry, I just wanted. I just wanted to add that there is sort of this challenge, especially in Belize, to get records that go far enough back to get this what you're calling free land clearing. Um, but I will just echo uh, Professor Whitney and say that, that certainly the humans have been altering and engaging with forests and since they've been around. So um, I think that it's safe to sort of interpret those records, even if they did go far enough back um, as, as having some human impact, right? Yeah, yeah, I agree completely. That's extremely interesting. And I was wondering, because as you know, I worked at um, La Manai um, as an archaeologist for some time. And I wonder if you were able to look at any samples or if there's plans um, to get any samples from um, areas towards um, Coco Chan or, or Kaka Beach, so further in west, and if that would um, be any, anything interesting. Uh, for um, <laughs> yes, always. The answer is always. <laughs> if there are records, we're more than happy to look at them. Um, one of those, one of those pollen records that I showed was from a core that was sampled in 1999. So um, we often are analyzing things that are, have been collected quite a long time ago, but also because it is mm -hmm. it is such a labor intensive process. So. Um, the, the, the short answer is always yes, uh, we need to have a much better spatial representation of, of um, cores in order to understand what was happening, you know, right next to temple sites versus what was happening, you know, or, or, you know, for, further afield into in around house mounts, because those land mm -hmm. uses would have been different. But they take so much work to just generate those those few records mm -hmm. that it is it is the work of a lifetime. And hopefully one of these days the work that's done in Belize. Um, and that's that is my own, you know, ultimate hope because you would expect to see better questions mm -hmm. and better science by by people who are, are based in country. Yeah. yeah. And are there a lot of um, challenges um, in terms of actually physically taking the, the samples in <laughs> in such remote areas? I don't know if you can uh, elaborate on that. 
Um, they're often not remote. It's but it's still a slog through a lot of mud. Um, the equipment's quite heavy. Uh, everything's done manually, so both pushing down and pulling back up again. Um, so the, the the challenges are are actually physical work. And I kind of joked last year that you know I'm getting too old for this um, because <laughs> it's just it is it is actually physically demanding. Um, so there's those challenges, but. One of the things about paleo work is that you never know what you're going to get. So as soon as you shove down a core, you could you could have meters and meters of beautifully preserved sediments. And then it comes back and it turns out that it's a thousand years old. Sometimes it comes back and it's 10,000 years old. And so you you often find sites and you think this is going to be a beautiful representation of this particular time frame whether it be, you know, um, the very early Holocene forests or, or the post-classic, and you just don't know until the radiocarbon dates come back and then you have a better idea of what you're looking for. Um, so as Rebecca pointed out, it's the difficulty is finding the sites, finding old water bodies, things that haven't been drained, palm swamps that might be old enough. And then on top of it, you just simply don't know the age until you've spent about six months in the analysis already. So um, I think paleoecologists are probably gamblers by nature <laughs> because we just we just take them and we and we have to run with what we get um, by the other side. It's extremely interesting. Um, yeah, I, I'll any... just add that it also takes a lot of money um, to to gamble <laughs> on those carbon dates as well. So. Uh, when they come back and they're early, we we are very happy. <laughs> so you also have to make sure you find them, like you said, the right spot for the. Yeah, and um, I just want to say uh, that finding the right spots also entails a lot of um, local knowledge as well. So just uh, just sort of want to give give mm -hmm. credit to mm -hmm. a lot of local individuals that have helped me in particular find uh, bodies of water that um, I wouldn't have been able to find otherwise. I think Dr. Ford wanted to... I think you're muted. Let me see if I can... Muted. It's yes, we can hear you now. Okay, I, I, um, I have lots of questions, but maybe better offline. But one was you talked about generalities and I think when we talk about changes in climate we have to look at the resolution and our paleo data are pretty gross so when we talk about, we hear things that there's a drought I am just very unconvinced about uh, about the way precipitation or is handled in the, uh, in the archaeological record because of the resolution of the data and when you are out there with forest gardeners like Narciso um, it's not the annual precipitation. So if the annual pre precipitation average in Cayo was 1500 or 1800 millimeters, and you notice in the paleo record that the it's a lower than average, I'm not quite sure how one does that anyway, but lower than average does not talk about delivery. We have two rainy seasons and one dry season. And if you talk to farmers, they're planting all the time and uh, looking at other kinds of signals. So if the first rains, which are the um, coming from the east, the hurricanes, they're the warm wet, they expect a, a better harvest then. Then we get the northerns, uh, and those are um, cold wet, less wet. Um, I think that we need to be very cautious the way we talk about. I, do, I love the idea of resilience, and I very think that the Maya were very adaptable and had flexible systems. But that resolution issue is very bothersome to me. Um, I, I, again, I, I agree completely. Um, we're never going to get the resolution in the pollen records because of the sorts of archives that we have to use. They, they're very blurred. So we might have a sample that represents something like 20 years. And, and that loses all of the detail of the, the, the seasonal uh, changes, as you've pointed out, but also the interannual changes. Um, and that, when we match it up against where we get the climate records from, are largely the speleothem records. The, uh, okay, are the, they, and, and they're not very resolute either. Um, they're getting to points now where they're, and, and I'm only speaking for my colleagues here, so this is not me, but um, we're getting to the point now where we're starting to see uh, certain speleothems they can get seasonal signals out of. So it, it depends on the records, but then of course, you get these beautiful records in some places and then not so many beautiful records in others. So any sort of spatial representation, and again, in a system, that, a country that's got very diverse 
vegetation, very diverse climates, then you, you're also losing that. So I agree, caution is, is very much needed. Yeah, and um, generalizing from one stalagmite would be for me also, uh, even if it had really good resolution, which I will leave that for another debate, um, is still something you can't say, oh, well, this place at this one, and I'd like <clears throat> I liked you explaining that everything is a quite an investment in time. Uh, but I really worry about generalizing over small data sets. And like you say, we need more. <laughs> do we? Yes, we do very much. <laughs> Thank you for that um, discussion. It's really interesting to um, hear from all of you and hear all of your views. And uh, we have another, we have quite um, a few questions. So we have one for uh, Dr. Ford. And colleagues, Let's see if I can. Um, yes. Have you found opportunities to share and encourage this perspective in Belize? I wonder how the perspectives may be shared or different different regions of Belize. That's a wonderful question, and I take this opportunity to announce that Narciso Torres has just been awarded. I haven't seen the letter, but awarded the Meritorious Citizen. A national award that will be presented next week in um, Belize City by the Governor General and the Prime Minister of Belize. So uh, here's one person that Cynthia and I promoted gave a nomination, uh, a nomination for and has come forward as a person who can be a symbol of these forest gardeners. In addition to that, we do we did a library tour all together. Uh, all over uh, uh, mobile uh, presentations all over Belize and got input from a lot of different forest gardeners and home gardeners. And we also have forthcoming uh, working with the National Institute of Culture and History and the Museum of Belize will be doing a, a Maya exhibit um, on uh, forest gardening and El Pilar. So that should come out sometime, maybe at the end of the year or next year. So those are just a few of the things that we have uh, promoted and that's pretty much all we do. We present things all over schools, in villages, around. If you talk to us. <laughs> that's great. That's great to hear. We yeah. have so we um, can applause for Narciso. Applause for Narciso. <laughs> mm -hmm. And we have another question uh, also from Ali um, Yaral. Um, and this is directed to um, Lion, um, how are young folks being introduced to Maya writing in different contexts within your project? How do they do with learning um, a glyph-based writing system? Well, for for kids, it's actually we're, we do it in schools. We go to primary schools, and you know, and how do they do well? The kids is a hieroglyph. You introduce it to the kids as a, almost like a code writing. And once you introduce each particular glyph and you explain to them uh, the phonetic of every of every of every symbol that you you, you give them, and we're using a, a syllabary. And the kid, it's amazing how fast and quick the kids would pick it up. You know, in a session within the first thirty minutes, forty minutes of of introducing the system to the kids, the kids will will start to put together glyphs, and you know it's very fast. It's very fast. It's, it's just amazing how quickly kids uh, adapt into that into that system. You know, uh, and I have seen that it's it's easier for kids than for adults. Adults will struggle a little bit more because of the structure, and kids tend to to run with it really quickly. So in a matter of thirty minutes. You know, kids are starting to put together glyphs, and in an hour, they're pretty much writing their names. And um, this is what we've seen when we've done the, you know, the little workshops that we do. And kids will come to to the workshops, and you know, we spend 20 minutes, 25 minutes explaining to them how it works. And before you know it, they're putting together glyphs. So, so yeah, that's it's just amazing how kids, you know, adapt to it very quickly. Mm -hmm. And do you work with the same children over and over, um, or you go to different schools and work with different groups? Do okay. kids remember um, after some time? Yes. So, so what we do on the first session, we introduce it to them. 
So we don't expect the kids to memorize all the hieroglyphs because in the syllabus there's many of them, and for every phonetic sound there is more than one glyph. So during the first session they're introduced to it, and using a syllabus they'll put together words, and and then they will remember a couple um, a couple things about the system. But what I what I work with especially is for them to remember the structure of how you put it together. And then, um, as for the Maya Writing Club, the kids that I work with on a constant basis would be the kids from the club at Mount Carmel High School. So at the high school, we do work with a, with a set of kids. Um, and I'm proud to say that this year, one of, the, one, of the, one of the kids that started the project when he was in, in the second year of high school, he's back at, high, at the high school this year and he's teaching. So he's coming back as a teacher and he's going to be helping me out with the, with the writing club at Mount Carmel High School. So I'm really proud of him, you know, uh, seeing him grow. And he was one of the few uh, kids who grew in understanding and always wanted more. And when we went out on our district to do workshops, uh, him along with Jaime and a few others would join me and, and to go out and, and teach. So I'm really glad that, um, you know, there's a few of them out there that still continue to practice it. Um, you know, many of the others take it as a club, but, um, you know, they do remember a lot of it. So right now, I think this year, um, I'm hoping that I bring back uh, a lot of them that uh, have shown interest that have taken the, the workshop uh, will join me uh, going around the country to, to teach to teach the system. So I'm excited for what is coming this year, you know, especially at the, at the high school. And, you know, we open to invitations from, from different primary schools to go out and, and share this information, share it with kids, you know, whether it's uh, you're taking social studies or history or tourism, we will go out and, and we'll share this information with you. So, um, you know, like I said, we're looking for partners and, you know, okay. as long as the teachers and the schools are, are open for us to come, we'll come in and, and introduce it. And if there's a way for us to, to make a, a system where we'll be coming back every month or, or every week, then we're going to put it into place. You know, so that's that's the, the whole process. That's amazing. Um, we actually have another question, but before that, um, I think if anyone, uh, any of the viewers would like to reach you, I think they can reach you through um, Facebook um, okay. and also uh, your email or your um, your uh, phone number. Um, I think maybe we can share it um, later on in the um, in the comments or when we re-upload your presentation to make sure if anyone wants to contact you uh, or if any kids are interested in joining then uh, then they, we can make sure they reach you uh, we have another question directed to you from elizabeth um, she's asking have you worked with any schools in the city and also what if an adult um, is interested Okay, Belize City, we haven't done anything in Belize City yet, um, but we, you know, if you're interested in learning, reach out to us and, you know, we will find a way to to get you in. Um, you know, in the beginning, it might be we could do a, either a Zoom meeting or, or online, and, and then we'll find a way to, you know, maybe partner with one of the schools in Belize City and get a group together, you know, either you and some friends, and then we'll make the trip and we'll come to, we'll come to you and, and try to make this happen. Um, you know, and then look out for us. I'm, I'm hoping to, to be around, you know, I think any event that is coming up, we're going to try to be part of them. So look out for us at, the, at some of the, the events coming up, you know. Um, I think they're going to be a celebration of the activity at the Plum and I. So I, I should be there. So if you have a chance to come out to Plum and I, you know, we will be there. And 
this year we're trying to make a presence at any of the cultural activities um, around the country. We're going to try and make an effort to be around, to, to spread the word and, and take this system to the country. That's amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to make sure to share your contact details so that people can reach out to you if they're um, interested. And that concludes our Q&A session uh, for this segment um, of our symposium. Thank you so much for the uh, presenters, for their input and for the amazing discussion. And um, we're going to go on a short coffee break um and then come back in 15 minutes thank you so much all right thank you thank you
area is Hello everyone and welcome back from the coffee break. We hope you're enjoying the diversity of perspectives we have showcased so far regarding cultural communities and knowledge for a more resilient belief. Um, we will now move on to our final session for this morning with a focus on case studies from Belizean resilience, mostly situated, situated around uh, Belize city. First, uh, we will hear from Professor Melissa Espat. Uh, Professor Espat has a dual master's in education and English education, which have caused her work 
studies and interests to revolve around promoting and preserving Belizean culture. Um, she co-wrote, produced, and directed a stage adaptation of Becca Lamb, encouraging students to actively engage with the literary work while creating a concept inspired by the author's insights. Additionally, uh, she has collaborated with various organizations dedicated to empowering vulnerable and marginalized communities. Recognizing the significance of the south side of the country, she believes that working alongside um, Evan Hyde and the parish can bring about a fresh awareness of the challenges faced by those living in that region and also fostering positive change and inclusivity. So we will now hear from Professor Espad on Literature as Catalysts, the Partridge Street Effect. It's Lake Independence, a constituency within the Belize district. During the 2020 general elections, it had a substantial voter base with 4,863 registered voters, making it one of the most sizable constituencies nationwide. Unfortunately, this region is also recognized for its poverty and gang affiliation. So how did it get this way? The construction of the Belize capital in 1973 marked a new chapter symbolizing the aspirations of a nation yearning for self-governance and independence. However, the trajectory wasn't without its challenges. Southside areas adopted North American practices inadvertently paving the way for the emergence of gangs and structural violence. In the 1980s, Lake Eye was painfully evolving out of an expansive swamp that attracted poor families who laboriously chopped out mangrove trees, dumped landfill on a portion of the land they cleared, and built ramshackle structures from whatever building materials they could hustle. The living conditions were deplorable, and in the 1980s, the alarm sounded that the youth in the Lake Independence area were becoming increasingly violent and lawless. The prediction was that if the Asians' lives and livelihoods would be in great peril. During the 1970s, as the South Side faced difficult living conditions due to poverty, a group of men undertook a mission to raise awareness about the state of the pre-independent nation and the community's role in driving positive changes. The UBAD movement emerged between 1969 and 1974, drawing inspiration from figures like Lionel Clark, Evan Anthony Hyde, Ismail Shabazz, Michael Stephen, Jack Jordan, Edgar Richardson, Wilfred Nicholas Sr., and many others, who were influenced by the teachings of Marcus Garvey's UNIA and Islam. In March 1961, Evan X. Hyde, then 21 years old, assumed the presidency for the UBAD Party for Freedom, Justice, and Equality. As a propaganda organ of the UBAD, the Amandala newspaper was first published in August of that same year, and it has continued to exist on the same fundamental principles of social justice for people of color promulgated by UBAD four decades ago. When it first hit the streets, Amandala was said to be nothing but fire, pure and incorruptible fire, challenging the colonial status quo. In the first edition, the editors defined the newspaper as power to the people, further saying, we have to be able to decide our own destiny, to do our own thing, so that we can gain greater knowledge of self and kind. The newspaper continued to rail against the injustices of the then backward colonial British Honduras with its mantra for freedom, justice and equality, emphasizing black and proud as a cultural philosophy of upliftment for the marginalized Creole and Garifuna peoples. 
Furthermore, they demanded that African and Maya history be taught in schools, and they expanded voting rights from 21 to 18 years. Pressure came from the government on UBAD, and as they disbanded in the mid-1970s, a mandala took a new direction. The newspaper also began addressing economic matters and job creation in the struggling south side of Belize City, where its headquarters were on Parchment Street. By Belize's independence in September 1981, Amandala was on the brink of becoming the nation's leading newspaper, and by 1989, it pioneered Belize's first private radio station, Creme Radio, followed by obtaining a television license in 2000. Creme Television launched in September 2004, completing the communication complex known as Creme Mandala consisting of a Mandela newspaper, Creme Radio, and Creme Television. At the corner of Partridge Street is the handprint of the Society of Jesus. The initial Jesuits arrived in Belize from Jamaica in 1851, and they were later joined by a diverse group. In 1887, the Society established St. John Berkman's College in Belize City. The origin of St. Martin de Porres Parish dates back to 1966, initiated by Father Frank Stoby SJ, who established a school in a fast-growing area of Belize City. The site was once a swamp named Prisoner's Creek, cleared by prisoners to expand the city. In 1969, St. Martin de Porres was officially established as an independent parish and school. Its name honors St. Martin de Porres, known for advocating social justice, aligning with the parish's commitment to marginalized communities. Father Thomas Throw, S.J., became the first pastor, with Brother Carl Swift, S.J., assisting in pastoral care. Today, the school now educates over 550 children from preschool to middle school, with plans to further expansion. Despite obstacles in funding, the hope is to work toward a new school building. All to adopt a direction that combines the service of faith with the promotion of justice. This shift was not limited to social outreach, but became integral to the society's activities. The motto, the service of faith and the promotion of justice, now defines Jesuit identity, mission, and public perception. In 2019, the Father General of the Society of Jesus introduced the Universal Apostolic Preferences to respond to the Church's needs. The preferences emphasize pursuing the greater good across various apostolic endeavors. The imperative to champion the cause of social justice has taken on a heightened significance for the Society of Jesus. St. Martin de Porres finds itself embarking upon a fresh and transformative path that aligns with the second and third preferences to walk with the poor, and to accompany the youth. This new direction is poised to advance the principles of service to faith and the promotion of justice and address the pressing needs of the residents within the Lake Independence community. In doing so, St. Martin de Porres solidifies its commitment to its core values and positions itself as a beacon of positive change and holistic care for the local population. The convergence of these two influential institutions, one championing black and indigenous pride alongside the fight for social justice, and the other serving as a steadfast advocate for the vulnerable and marginalized through spirituality, signifies the beginning of a wide range of possibilities. This alignment promotes a thorough and deep exploration of community intricacies, creating a space for open dialogue that has the potential to bring about significant change. Remarkably, the very realities that Evan X Hyde shed light on during the 1970s persist today 
etching their presence within the experiences of the youthful population in Belize City. Eubag's emergence in that era ignited a much needed exploration of the multifaceted challenges of poverty and adversity. In the Rockville Declaration, members of UBAD and the People's Action Committee admitted, we recognize that our society was built on violence by our colonial masters and that our present system is maintained by the colonialist powers. We see the great incidence of poverty, ignorance and disease in our society as violence perpetrated on the people. It is our duty, therefore, to answer this violence by defending ourselves against it, against violence to the people, violence by the people against the oppressor, against reactionary violence, revolution against any violence. The aspiration now is to kindle a revival of that consciousness, to awaken a new awareness, the awareness that can pave the way for a shift in our way of life. In the aftermath of UBAD's dissolution in February 1974, Hyde found a creative outlet in journalism, concurrently publishing Feelings in 1975, a compilation primarily comprising fiction pieces. Earlier this year, St. Martin de Porres initiated efforts to address social justice concerns within Belizean society. We approached Evan X. Hyde for permission to use one of his pieces from his anthology Feelings for a theatrical production. Our rationale behind this decision was twofold. First, we believed that the literature from the 1970s authentically captured the essence of the life in the Lake Independence area during that time, which is also a reflection still pertinent today. Second, our church is actively committed to raising awareness of the challenges faced by youth in the community, as exemplified by character Don Don Blue in the short story Wedan Jan De. These characters representing themes like injustice, family struggle, the American dream, wealth, inhumanity, and police brutality, all intertwine with love and faith unveil a poignant exploration. Wejan Jande, the gender-based violence, women's rights, poverty, peer pressure, and cultural spirituality. Evanix Hyde generously allowed us creative freedom to adapt this piece into a stage performance, which promises to be a powerful portrayal of the experiences our youths face. The combined efforts of influential figures in Belize City, starting with Evanix Hyde's voice, are poised to create a captivating and thought-provoking experience at the Belize Center for the Performing Arts. This performance aims to shine a spotlight on these pressing issues and stimulate meaningful dialogue within our community. By dissecting this literary performance, we gain the capacity to delve into, into the intricate roots of the insecurities plaguing our youth due to the relentless grip of poverty. Certainly, the two notable establishments located along Partridge Street each possess unique approaches to catalyzing transformation within the Lake Independence community. One stands resolute in its unwavering dedication to prayer and spirituality, channeling its efforts through a profound connection with the divine. In stark contrast, the other institution, with a laser-like focus, endeavors to reshape the fabric of societal thought processes aiming for comprehensive shift that extends beyond the community's boundaries and encompasses the entirety of the nation. Despite the apparent dichotomy in their approaches, a common thread of purpose binds these institutions, coursing deep within their collective essence. Their shared purpose is none other than the unwavering commitment to be veritable catalysts of social transformation. Their primary purpose aligns on a significant platform of creating substantial change, confronting injustices with unwavering determination, 
cultivating peace and harmony in the midst of turmoil and building roads that guide people towards a rich garden of opportunities where everyone can flourish and succeed and establishing pathways that lead people to a wealth of opportunities where everyone can thrive and succeed. Despite their different approaches, both institutions possess an unwavering spirit that propels them as effective catalysts for positive change. Their steadfast mission goes beyond individual methods. United, they become a powerful force for good. Their joint endeavor involves an unceasing fight against deep-rooted injustices with their voices collectively challenging the established order and advocating for those who have been silenced for too long. United in purpose, they forge ahead with unwavering determination towards a horizon where equity and justice prevail. Guided by prayer and empowered by transformative thinking, they navigate the intricate challenges that confront them. As these institutions work together, their combined efforts have a greater impact than what they can achieve individually. This impact isn't limited to the Lake Independence community. It extends across the entire nation, promoting unity, compassion, and countless opportunities for everyone in the future. A very insightful presentation by uh, Professor Espat. Thank you so much for your contribution. I can't wait for the question and answer um, segment. Uh, for any of you who want to ask um, a question from Professor Espat, uh, or about her presentation, please make sure to post your comments in the comment section on Facebook or YouTube. We will be addressing them at the Q and A section at the end of uh, uh, at the end of the session. Uh, next up, um, we have uh, Dr. Christia um, De Guerra. Uh, she is an associate professor and mental health counselor at Gala University, and earned her PhD from. University at Albany at the School of Social Welfare in May 2023. Congratulations. Um, she lives here in Belize, where her research interests are gang-involved women, mental health, and uh, perpetration-induced trauma. Previously, she worked as a clinical social worker, uh, conducting mental health counseling in Southside Belize City um, and at the Princess Royal Youth Hostel. Her research has included a pilot study on gang-involved women in Belize, which was the first study to examine gang, involved, uh, gang involvement in women in Belize and served as a foundation for her larger dissertation research titled Talking Sweet and Moving Quiet, Trauma and Resiliency in Gang-Involved Girls in Belize. Uh, we welcome Dr. De Guerre and, um, to present to us um, her presentation titled Similarly, talking sweet and moving quiet, trauma and resiliency in gang involved girls in Belize. Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Christia Deguerre, and I am here today to talk about research that I have done with gang involved girls in Belize. Just so you know, due to time constraints, I will only be discussing one small piece of my research. And the research is entitled Talking Sweet and Moving Quiet, Trauma and Resiliency in Gang-Involved Girls in Belize. Throughout this presentation, you'll see artwork created by the participants. And again, due to time constraints, we may not really get into that today. The aspect of my research that I am covering today is the push factors for gang involvement. What were the girls um, pinpointing as their reasons for joining the gang? Now, overall, the research project does go into many different factors, such as um, roles in the gang that the girls played, um, how gender and sexuality come into play, and how cultural level sexism does cause them to experience success in the gang. Um, but we will not get into that because of time constraints. So let's get started on the push factors for gang joining.
First, relevant research. Um, international research does say that childhood maltreatment is a risk factor for gang joining for girls. Um, this research is from the United States, United Kingdom, Mexico, and other areas of the Caribbean. Uh, the perceptions and classifications of gang-involved girls and women tend to be dismissed. Um, it tends to be where they are seen as just gang girlfriends and not real gang members. And there is a direct link between sexual behavior and respect in the gang, but we will not be getting to that today. So the theories that were used to guide my research is trauma theory and feminist theory. Uh, trauma theory states that a history of childhood trauma is one of the strongest predictors of engagement in violent behaviors and involvement in the criminal justice system for girls and feminist theory. Feminist theory was used to examine gendered experience within the gang and cultural systematic inequalities and perceptions of girls. The one research question I will focus on today for our presentation is what childhood events and experiences are associated with joining the gang for girls in Belize. And my research was a qualitative narrative life story based research where I met with 11 girls over a period of three in depth interviews. Interview one was demographic information adverse childhood experiences, and trust building. Interview two were gang experiences, gang gender dynamics, and then the introduction of the creative art project. The art materials for the creative art project were brought home by the participants, and they were able to create anything um, that they would like to show their story or what they'd like to tell the viewer. And interview three was processing the creative art project, asking questions like, why did you draw what you did? What does it mean to you? What is the message? And so on. This methodology was um, developed by me to be empowering. The participants were able to tell me how much or how little of their life story they'd like. They were in charge of that information. They were able to choose their own pseudo names that you will see on the slide um, after this one. And they were able to be in control of how they would um, create their art project, what materials they would like to use, what they'd like to show, and so on. Um, additional um, power dynamics that you find in research. They were the experts and I was the listener. Um, and I wanted to make sure that um, they knew that in this process. Going forward to the results. So here you can see on the screen, we had 11 participants. All the names that you see throughout this presentation are pseudo names to protect the identity of the participants. We can see the age ranges were from 13 years old to 18 years old. And we can see the gang factions that they were associated with. Um, we have NSG, Northside Gang, PIV, BLC, PSC, and so on here on the screen. You can see the art to the left side of the screen, and it reads, we are all the same. And again, you'll see art from all the participants um, throughout this presentation. We will not be getting into gang role today. Again, like I said, due to time limitations, but I wanted you to see just the diversity of the participants in this study. Moving on to the focus of this presentation today, childhood traumatic experiences. On the screen, you can see the diversity of the experiences um, that each girl labeled as important to her eventual gang joining. And I'm going to focus on the top three most common, which are witnessing traumatic events in the home. Every participant labeled this as important to later gang joining, um, 11 out of 11. And they discuss such things as domestic violence, drug use and abuse in the home, violence in the home, um, and so forth. Community violence was number second, number two. Um, that was nine out of 11 participants described community violence being important to later gang joining. And this were things like witnessing events in their neighborhood and community, such as murder, violent sexual assault, robberies, and so forth. 
And the third most common, seven out of 11 participants described sexual abuse in the home as um, significant and later gang joining. Um, sexual abuse was most often perpetrated by family members or close family friends. And on the following screen, um, following um, screen, you will see that there are direct quotes from the participant. And as I discuss the topic, you can read the direct quotes and really get a feel for their experiences in their own words. Going to the one most common witnessing traumatic events in the home, this participant described a intrafamilial feud that led to arson that led to a death of her mother. Um, and we know that when home becomes an unsafe place, children look for safety and security elsewhere, which each participant described finding that in the gang, right? Um, the gang treated them as family. Many participants going on to even say, this was the first time I felt family love. So traumatic events in the home, especially violent traumatic events in the home, act as push factors for girls to later find this family type of atmosphere, protection and safety elsewhere because they're not experiencing it in the home. And you can read through the quote here on the screen. On the right side, you can see a song that a participant um, created as their art project. So this illustrates that they're really able to create anything that they'd like. And this song lyric goes through the experiences she had in a home where witnessing traumatic events were significant. Um, Nobody seems to care at all is a lyric. Um, no matter how hard I tried, no matter how many tears I cried, my family doesn't seem to care. So this participant was really illustrating the feelings that she had in growing up in this environment at home. So moving on to community violence. Community violence was another significant push factor for later gang joining. You can read again on the screen the quote from the participant where she describes witnessing a murder at 10 years old as well as a violent sexual assault at 10 years old. And here in this quote, we can really see the voicelessness that children experience. She says, no one would listen to me even if I tried to get help because I was just a child. Experiencing these traumatic events that many of us could never dream of or could never think of, they also know that as a child, they have no power. They, they, no one will listen to them. And again, these um, elements are reflected in the art project to the right of the screen. Community violence was significant as many participants described living in unsafe um, neighborhoods where they felt life is short um, or this is just a way of life. So they would say, of course, this is what I got into because this is what I grew up seeing. Moving on to sexual abuse. Sexual abuse was the third most common traumatic experience in childhood. We can read it right here where the participant is reflecting that they actually developed PTSD-like symptoms. As of note, all participants described PTSD-like symptoms, but there was lack of formal diagnosis. So as a researcher and clinician, I am looking at the symptoms they describe and, and saying that it could be PTSD, but note that there was no formal diagnosis due to lack of resources, as well as mistrust for the system. Here we can see that this um, experience led to nightmares, flashbacks, and then the development of being rebellious and disrespectful in her own words. So oftentimes, especially when teenagers start to misbehave, many individuals see it as them just being bad. And I would like to invite people to start getting curious about this behavior, because oftentimes if we investigate, we can find there's a serious and impactful reason for it, such as sexual abuse. All right, moving on to cultural views on gender. 
So you can read the quote here on the screen, but significantly um, each participant, 11 out of 11, understood how cultural views on gender lead to success for them in the gangs. They would describe that no one would look at us, no one would suspect us for being in a gang because we are young girls and women. And due to this, they were able to find success in the gang, respect in the gang that they didn't find elsewhere. So they were able to acknowledge that because of this idea of what a girl or a young woman does or doesn't do, they were able to go into the gangs and be successful. As well as cultural views on gender affect the prevalence rates of sexual abuse, right? So we know girls are more often sexually abused than young boys, um, and this leads them to the gang, but also these cultural views on gender cause them to find success in the gang. So we have this paradoxical relationship. And I wanted to showcase some of these artworks really quickly. One of the most profound pieces of art was this two piece artwork by Kate, which again is a pseudo name. Here on the left, you can see the map of Belize and in the map of the Belize is a gun. And she describes that Belize is so affected by gun violence, it is now hard for her to think about Belize without gun violence. So it's become a part of the country for her. And on the right side, you can see a boy who is on the ground dying of gunshot wound. This was drawn from her memory as a child, again, highlighting those traumatic experiences. And here on this screen, you see some more positive images of resilience. The, both of these artworks show that although you can go through hard times, that you should not give up and the sun will shine soon. So although these girls have been through so many traumatic experiences, they have and found resiliency in getting up and surviving for another day, finding hope that the future will bring better opportunities for them. Creative art projects, I wanted to just have this in there really quickly um, about the positive effect of this research methodology. So this research methodology was rooted in therapeutic intervention and many of the girls on their own expressed gratitude for this experience that it gave them a sense of healing. So hopefully in the future, we want to develop this methodology as an intervention for gang involved girls or at risk for gang. Inclusion, belongingness, protection, and power are vital factors to gang joining. One participant described if she only had the gun that she had in the gang when she was young, she could have protected herself from sexual abuse. So protection and power. And again, that family love that they all described um, from joining the gang. Early childhood experiences proved to be pivotal in the girls' lives, particularly witnessing traumatic events in the home, community violence, and sexual abuse. Childhood trauma experiences are associated with motivation for later gang and join, joining and widespread violence. So as this is the first research study to acknowledge girls and gangs in Belize, there are many implications here and I will share a few. It is critical for helping professionals and society at large to understand the connection between childhood traumatic experiences and later gang enjoyment. National reforms must be made to legislation and policy regarding child protection, gender rights, discrimination, family support, education, and fair employment practices. Reforms in these areas should be made to offset the direct and indirect draw of the gang. As a researcher, I acknowledge that screening measures may be potentially harmful. We see that boys often are targets of police. Um, and we know this is not helping the gang situation in Belize. So with knowledge of girls and gangs, there is a potential for them to be over-policed, such as boys. But this research serves as a call to do something different. Let's focus therapeutically and empathetically on the root causes for gang joining. So our next, our future children do not have these um, push factors for gang joining rather than policing and punishment. In effect, each relevant service sector needs to undertake an empathetic and restorative approach and establish prevention and intervention programs. 
get at these children before they join the gangs now that we know the root causes. And quickly, dedication. I dedicate this research to all the girls who wanted their stories heard to help the girls that come after them. This research would not be possible without your incredible bravery and courage. You are a survivor setting the world on fire with your truth, and you never know who needs to hear your light, your warmth, and your raging courage. And I just want to share my contact information for anybody who'd like to contact me outside of this forum to discuss this research or any relevant information. Thank you so much for listening today. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Deguera, um, for this um, presentation. I think we have to acknowledge um, that it was very heavy. Uh, but also very important and crucial um, topic to discuss. And thank you for, for bringing that to Culture Symposium. Also a huge thank you for um, both of our presenters um, for their enlightening sessions on the challenges and successes of these very resilient communities within Belize's society. And we will now open the floor to our audience for a live Q&A. So I would like to welcome um, our presenters to the live stream. Good day, everyone. Thank you for being here. We have quite a few questions, so let's, let's jump in. Um, first of all, we have one directed to Professor Espat. Um, amazing presentation and thank you for featuring this work. I'm wondering if you can expand more on how these types of literary and arts projects, including the Becca Lamb production you created, um, have been made more accessible um, to the rest of the country outside of Belize City. Well, first of all, good morning and thank you for having me here. Um, I just wanted to make a clarification. I am not a professor yet, hopefully soon. <laughs> Ms. Espat is quite fine, but I'm, I'm honored. That's fine. Um, so what I wanted to explain to you is these, both of these pieces, both Bekalam and Feelings, well, Bekalam is available all around the world. Um, I think you can get it on Amazon. Feelings is available on Google Books. Uh, the play, I wrote these plays based on what I read. And for each of them, I had to ask permission. Uh, I asked that both authors, um, Shira Sinkisi, Edel, happily told us yes and we actually sat to talk about the characters and what they meant in uh, for Belize in the 1950s and how they were substantially important today for Evan X Hyde's play we called him to and he said I want for me I had seen John John on stage before but I said I wanted to add more to it so that the audience can understand the implications of of the story and the characters in today's society. And so I again took pieces and, and several pieces of the anthology. There are actually three pieces that I merged together and I wrote them. And so I have access to that play. So there isn't um, to say that there is a script for them. I read it, I, I, I saw the need to share it. And so I created the script. But both of the pieces, both of the books are available for an audience. and. In fact, Evan X Hyde has a series of books available on Amazon that you can get. And online, um, Amandala is also available, so you have access to that. These are accessible to anyone worldwide. I thank hope I answered so the question. Thank yes, you. thank you so much. We also, I just want to highlight that uh, we had comments um, in the uh, comment section that said that Becca Lamb, the Becca Lamb play from my high school days is part of my core memories. So it certainly meant a lot to um, to the to the kids and the young adults that you um, that you involved. There you go. Here's the comment. So well, um, I also do remember the speaker, one of my students, past students. So I am grateful that it was. Um, it was a memorable experience for the students, the students who participated then. Um, I was a teacher at St. Catherine Academy, and so the students had to take over the entire thing. It was in their uh, perspective. So thank you. Thank you for remembering. Thank you. 
Um, we also have another question directed to uh, Dr. Daguerre. Um, let me just... Uh, I appreciated the conversation about power dynamics in the interview process. How do you think your findings may have changed if you hadn't encouraged their power in the interviews? Well, first, thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be back at the Culture Symposium. I think it's the third year, um, which is amazing. Um, but yeah, so power dynamics in the research are so important. And research shows us that if you do not work on those power mismatches, those dynamics, you're not going to get as authentic answers. Um, you're not going to build a relationship of trust. And you need that before you get into any of these topics that are more heavy, like our um, our my our um, research touched on, right? So if you're talking about trauma, if you're talking about these experiences, as, and if you're talking about gang activity, which if you do not have trauma and you don't empower these individuals, they don't have any reason to tell you these things. These are very intimate things. So without um, really working on that imbalance of power in the research, you're not going to get as authentic. Um, responses. They may not trust you and, you know, they may even not even partake in, in the research project. Mm -hmm. And uh, what are some of the techniques that you can use um, throughout the interview process that do this? Yeah, so a lot of my research methodology is inspired and based in my experiences as a clinical mental health counselor. So I utilize a lot of those soft skills of um, person first language, you know, taking it slow, establishing rapport, getting to know them before going right into um, the trauma based stuff, but also things that I included in my research methodology. These participants were told from the start that they are the expert. I am here to learn from them where how many times as a teenager, especially an at-risk or gang-involved teenager, told that they're the expert in a room with an adult, right? So I took the learner stance. I learned from them. They were able to also choose their own pseudonames, which they enjoyed. They were able to create the art project in any way that they were drawn to. I just gave them the art supplies and told them to create something that depicts their experiences. Um, so a lot of these um, methodology factors were made to empower these participants and to help create that rapport of um, I am not here to judge you. I am here to get your story. And we see such a beautiful outcome because of that. Mm -hmm. It's super interesting to me. I would uh, personally, but I'm sure the um, other viewers also would love to learn more about the techniques as well, the interview techniques and the methodologies that you use, because it's so um, interesting and not just interesting but heartwarming how mm -hmm. people can really open up and it, it really brings a very truthful representation um to to the research so it would be lovely to <laughs> read the about your methodology as well um we have quite a few questions um so we have one directed to uh, melissa um Espat. Uh, what was the reaction of the church about the story? <laughs> um, okay, so the content that we are including in the in the play is very raw. And so before I even um, touched it, I had to sit with the with the pastor of the church, Father Andres. Um, and I was a bit nervous about it because I, I want the reality to be showcased and um we have several topics of you know birth control um premarital sex gang violence police brutality and lots of well you know it's alluded a lot of profanities as alluded in the play and and so i had to ask him you know how much of this are you okay with so can i can i do these these pieces and um, one of the things with the Society of Jesus and the Apostolic Preferences is that they have to be very open about the reality in our society, in our community. And they have a they have a very stern position of meeting people where they are, accepting things for what they are. And he said, "Go ahead, because these are issues that we have to talk about. They're not they're not going to get away. We can't hush it. We can't throw it under under the table. We can't." 
you can't be hiding the reality. And I said, are you sure I'm not going to get kicked out of the church after I'm done with playing? So just do it. So, but it's something that I'm I'm prepared to stand for. I do believe in many of the issues we're going to talk about. Um, and clearly, if we pretend they 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 don't exist, then we are going to continue with the same cycle, and it's the same cycle that um, that Krishna is, is Krishna is talking about. You know. Um, why can't we talk about these issues publicly? And so this is one of the things that I'm very happy with my church, with St. Martin de Porres, that they're they're willing to take that step in saying, let's talk about the realities that we're facing, that our youths are facing. Mm -hmm. It's very, very important. Um, we also have another question uh, directed to you. Um, it goes, do you clearly see the connection between uh, Krem and St. Martin? Well, I had a I had a conversation with Moses Hyde, and it was about next Hyde as well as the pastors of St. Martin's. And at first, they couldn't see it. They didn't see the connection there. You know, one represents an ideology; the other represents something in spirituality. And how can these two merge? And when I said, "But aren't you just both looking at the same thing? Social justice? Aren't we both fighting the same fight?" This is that we're using different methods, we're using different experiences. And that's when it became, you know, like a almost like a light bulb moment. Um, I spoke with Moses and he said, I don't see it yet, you know, but definitely you are a seeker and you're trying to find answers. And I am trying to find answers. And if mean if it means that I'm gonna sit with both both institutions and say, let's look at your objectives. What are you really focusing in achieving? And you know, in the end, it is the same objective. Let's fight for social justice. Let's try to change situations in our community. Let's try to find ways of getting answers. We're not gonna find immediate changes. We're not gonna have that, but at least the conversation starts. So yeah, that's where the connection is. Yeah, certainly. Um, we have another uh, maybe heavy question to uh, Dr. Deguerre, if I will put it up on the screen. Uh, thank you so much for the work you're doing. I'm wondering with the trauma and emotional distress the interview is expressed, how you personally manage the researcher interviewee relationship? So this is a big question and there's a lot of aspects to it. But on the participant side, one great thing in the way that I created this research methodology is that there's a healing aspect to it. Like I alluded to in the um, presentation, this is being looked at as becoming an intervention in itself. That trauma healing through art and the trauma healing through narrative storytelling um, mm -hmm has found to be healing in the participants itself. So I did have a protocol for if a participant got too upset or too heightened by the things they were talking about, but I never needed to use it because of how healing this was for them. And independently, and teenagers don't often do this, but independently they each said how grateful they were for this experience because they felt like it healed a part of them. They got their story out. So on the participants, side. Um, I had protocols to set them up with free counseling if if they needed to, if the distress came too much. But because of the positive effects of this methodology, um, that protocol wasn't needed. For myself, as being a mental health counselor for a number of years, I know the importance of taking care of yourself, having boundaries, um, work, home life balance, um, and being in counseling myself to, to talk about if anything comes up in in my experiences. It's very important to take care of your mental health as you're doing this kind of work as well. So all of these things were ingrained in there just to make sure everybody's mental health um, stayed where it needs to be through this whole um, this whole research process. Yeah, clearly. Um, we have another question directed to you um, uh, for Dr. Deguerre. What are the first steps we can take to go about breaking these cycles of generational trauma and violence found in our marginalized communities? I think the first step is recognizing and talking about it, right? Mm -hmm. And it no longer being this dark secret that stays in the shadows, right? There's no shame about having mental health struggles that are related to trauma, right? PTSD, all of these symptoms I've talked about 
it's normal for people to experience that when they've had these experiences and then acknowledge the impact that trauma has on individuals. Let's just talk about children that I talked about in my presentation, right? A lot of people like to label teenagers as bad or, you know, um, unruly, but they don't see it as actually a manifestation of trauma. Mm -hmm. So recognizing that is another step, but I think it goes back and since I've been working here as a mental health clinician in Belize for a number of years, I've seen it progress positively. We're talking about it more now than we did when I first started. So we're doing those first steps. It's just we have to continue those first steps and talk about it whenever possible. So each and every one of our viewers can be an advocate if they talk about their own struggles, if they talk about the resources they know that are out there, or just being a listening ear to people who have their own struggles without judgment. So we're moving into the, we're already in those first steps, we're doing it, and it makes me so proud to see that happening. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's interesting you say that because actually the second part of that uh, comment is that um, it often feels, mm -hmm. um, the efforts often feel fruitless unless we have a complete paradigm shift as a society regarding how we look at violence in our communities. Um, and the factors that cause them. So I, I think it ties in well with also what you were talking about, Miss um, Asbat, that um, it's not going to be an overnight paradigm shift like many of us would want to or wish to experience. Um, it's going to be a slower process and just being open about these issues and talking about it um, continuously. Let me see. Uh, we have so many questions. I, I want to, um, if we cannot get to all of the, the questions, I want to encourage um, um, both of you to, um, you can look through them um, after the session and you can answer them um, in a reply on Facebook or on YouTube. Um, I think maybe we have time for um, one more question. I think it's directed to um, Ms. Espat. Um, how do you intend to include different aspects of creativity in reaching your main goal? Okay, so one of the things that um, we have to understand is getting through to youth is, is a bit challenging because we are in a very um, commercialized community where social media has taken over. And so for sure, I had to include several more interesting factors in a place so that you know we have an audience that um, can appreciate the work, can appreciate the work that Abanex High did, as well as the creative component of being on stage. And so it is a um, it will have live music. Carlos Parote has um, dedicated some time to work on live music for the play, which has never been done before um, in theater here in Belize. So it's going to be live music with live performances. And I have an array of, um, of people who decided to volunteer their time in acting, including uh, our Karen Rosito, Duane Moody, we have Yastalia Singer, and then we have some of our junior SJC Junior College students who volunteered their time in being in the play as the protagonists for the piece. And so we're excited about that. But we're also very excited of continuing this conversation. For example, I'm here. Um, this has never been done before, where we're trying to exemplify how literature can be that catalyst for social change. So using this medium also, you know, is that creative factor. But I just quickly want to touch on something that um, that Elizabeth Morangai asked: Are why? How do we feel about these books not being included in our literature? I strongly believe that Evan Hyde's pieces should be um, should. I'll be very much a part of our Belizean history classes. And I also believe that we aren't putting much emphasis on African, Belizean African history, indigenous history. We are just not thinking that it has any relevance within our communities. But if we look at what Evan X. Hyde has written and that power to people, power to the marginalized, it's very important to include those. Becca Lam shows a lot of our history and, you know, I still think, well, I do know that certain high schools would use it as a part of their curriculum, second formers, third formers, 
but it has to be something that is done with gusto. You know, we can't just assign a reading and not explain the significance of the book. If we touch on those themes that are pertinent in our society today and look at how it was back then, we're using history as that narrative to tell us this is what it was, but this is how we can change it, right? So um, to answer Elizabeth, it's us, the community, the parents, the society to say we need to have more local, we need to have more local documentaries in our school system. We need to understand the importance of what, where we came from, where we're going, and how these pieces are that bridge to understanding our new way. And so definitely we want to have those conversations in the classroom. We want to start it as early as primary school, take it into high school and start asking the deeper questions, right? Not to just have it as, oh yeah, we have a quiz tomorrow on chapter two in Bekalam and what color dress did she wear? No, you know, talk about why were women out there in the political scenery? Why were young men not given opportunities in the workforce in the 1970s? Who are those people who created that society for us that, is a, that, that would affect who we are today? And so um, that conversation continues and hopefully St. Martin's and CREM can continue this conversation and include people like, um, well, include books like Bekalam and other pieces by V. Edgel and other great authors in Belize to have them a little bit, you know, more out there for our youths to listen to and, and to read and to understand. Certainly, and and um, just speaking from experience, there's a lot of learning, historical learning, or any kind of learning that comes from from these books. So it's not only from a literature or literary aspect, um, but also you can look at history, you can look at any subject, you know, biology, depending on the topic. So a lot of these, um, and, and I think a lot of them also bring, especially young people closer to, um, closer to their roots, um, it's closer to their interests, especially if it's uh, a more contemporary piece, um, because it, it helps, I think, helps people identify or, or sympathize um, or affiliate themselves with the characters or themselves with the stories. And when they find those parallels uh, between a main character and the story uh, and themselves um, as a main character, I think it, it also encourages a lot of learning um, in a more fun way as opposed to having to go through bullet points and, and cramming dates and, and numbers um, for history class. Um, mm -hmm. And it also helps people and, and young people think and, and reevaluate their position in, in society and in this time period. So um, it's definitely literature and books is, is very, very important. And there's a lot of use to, um, to that for other subjects as well, not only literature, I think. Mm -hmm. I could, um, I think we could go on forever. <laughs> uh, thank you for the um, amazing um, Q&A session and thank you for your answers and this discussion. Um, again, if you, if you feel um, like you, we missed a question, please feel free to go back into the comments and, and just share your reply um, if you wish. And thank you, for, um, thank you for being here. Thank you for your uh, presentations. Um, and now I would like to close um, our morning session uh, of the Culture Symposium. Um, don't forget that we're going to have our last afternoon session starting at 1 p.m. Uh, so make sure you come back to our YouTube or Facebook channels um, and see you soon. Thank you so much. Thank you.